Dear Heavenly Father, we just lift you up and glorify your name, Lord God. We praise you, Father. We praise you, Lord. We thank you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. We praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise your holy name. Thank you, Father. Praise you, Lord. Father God, we just thank you for this evening. We thank you for this opportunity to join in an electronic ecclesia across this world. Father God, spiritually united in prayer for you, Father, our spirit. We worship you in spirit and in truth. Father God, we pray in the name of Jesus that you will anoint us with your Holy Spirit, that you will dump down your Holy Spirit upon each and every one of us, Father God, that you will help each of us to, to empty our cups before you and fill us with only you. Lord God, we pray in Jesus' name for those of us who are struggling with sin, in the name of Jesus, Father God, that you will come upon us, that you will give us a supernatural strength to overcome, that you will make changes in our lives. We know the thoughts that you think about us, Father God, thought, not thoughts of evil, but thoughts of good to bring us to an expected end. We pray in the name of Jesus that you will rain down your Holy Spirit in our lives, that you will help us to walk in the Spirit, Father God, for we know that you love us. We know that you are going to direct our paths for the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and we claim it. He who practices righteousness is righteous just as he Jesus is righteous and he who sins willfully and habitually is of the devil father God we claim Matthew 5 6 blessed is he who hungers and thirsts for righteousness where he shall be filled thank you father God father in the name of Jesus we lift each and every listener of this radio show up and we ask you father to create in us a clean heart to empty our cups and fill us with a spirit of boldness to witness to people that are within the realm of our influence, Father. We know that we are approaching the time of the calamities. We know that we are approaching the time of the judgments upon the United States and all across this world. We know that we are approaching the point where the seals and the, and the scrolls will be rolled out, that the financial collapse will hit and ripple effect across the United States and across all the countries of the world. We know that the calamities are about to befall this world, Lord God, that World War III, the Psalms 83 war, Father, that, that, that the Gog and Magog invasion is about to be unleashed, that behold a pale horse is about to happen. Father, we can feel it in our hearts. We can feel it in our minds. We, we praise you, Lord God, for opening our hearts and our minds and helping us to understand what time it is. We praise you, Holy Father God, not only that, but for helping us to understand the things, the darkness that's about to befall this earth, to help us understand things like what is this strong delusion. Father, helping us to be at the right place at the right time, chosen before the foundations of the earth, Father. We pray that you will touch our hearts and our minds, prepare us spiritually for the things that are coming. Help us to be placed in a position whereby we can witness the people that are around us, that we can help them to understand that when these Things manifest before people but what they are. Help them to understand the glory and what the outcome of this, this spiritual and physical battle that's about to unfold across this earth, what the outcome is ultimately going to be. We praise you, Father God, for our King Jesus. We praise you, Holy Lord Jesus, for everything. We thank you for your advocacy. We praise you for being our friend. We praise you, Father. We thank you, Jesus. Lord God, we pray. Father God, for a hedge of protection upon every single listener of this radio show. We ask you, Lord God, to lift up a mighty, white, hot, holy fire of protection to surround round about every single listener in Jesus' name. We pray that you will surround every single uh, one of the listeners, loved ones, Father God, with a holy hedge of protection, Father God. In Jesus' name, touch us. Fill us with your Holy Spirit. Help us to go through each day, Father with your divine protection. We claim Psalms 91.11 upon our lives. We pray that you will send your angels to take charge over us, that you will surround our houses with link angels, interlocked arm in arm, letting nothing unclean enter. Let no forces of darkness, no threat vectors stand uncovered by your glorious power and your divine angels, Father God, in Jesus' name. We pray, Father, that you will bring us to the place that we need to be, filling our hearts with love, preparing us spiritually for the calamities that are about to befall this earth. Help us, Father. Help us lead people to the foot of the cross. Help us, Father, plant seeds of righteousness and holiness and repentance before those who do not know you. Father, we pray in Jesus' name that you will continue to protect divinely your holy land, Father God, and your 
chosen people. We pray that you will show the world how strong you are, Father God. Show yourself strong before the entire world as you did during the Six-Day War. Father, we're asking for a miracle, a divine hedge of protection, the the, the missiles, the these earthly weapons that are raised against your people, Father God, that they will be thwarted in flight. Father, in Jesus' name, we're asking for this to happen so that the entire world will see, so that people will be led to our King Jesus and the eternal gift of salvation through the shedding of your awesome blood, Jesus. We plead the blood of Jesus Christ over all of us. And now to him, Lord Jesus, who is able to keep us from stumbling and present us faultless before the presence of your glory, Lord God, with exceeding joy. And to you, Father, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory, majesty, and dominion in power both now and forever. We praise you, Father. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Oh, my gosh. Praise Jesus. Here we are. We are uh, we are very blessed this evening to have uh, Brother Dennis Callen joining us. Um, now, Brother Kenneth, you may hear some uh, you know dinging sounds and audio beeps and stuff uh, in the background because our, our our dear brother Kenneth is having some technical difficulties on his end with audio connectivity. Praise God, that's fine. Uh, he'll work that out. So you may hear a little bit of you know typing on the keyboard and stuff because behind the scenes we're going to be trying to bring Kenneth back up online and get everything situated. Situated there, praise God, um, and I'll just have to wait for him uh, to uh, to uh, uh, let me know when he's available to join us. Praise Jesus! Uh, but anyway, this evening we have Brother Dennis Callen uh, uh, that's going to come and share with us how he was able to confirm. Uh, of course, you know he, he he's a man of God. Uh, you know we talked uh, quite a bit. Uh, I'm exceedingly excited. I know that you'll be very excited too to hear what uh, Brother Callen has to say, uh, at what the Lord led him to the discernment that the the, the discernment discernment that the Lord led him to, uh, which is an understanding that matches the scripture. Um, you know, there's, uh, for example, if you, if you open up your Bibles, and we'll just talk about this real briefly, uh, if you open up your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians 2, and I'll do the best I can to kind of summarize this, see if I can capture this, um, you know, biblical dynamic. You know, I could sit here and just read the scripture to you, but I'm sure you've read it before, and and you've probably heard other people read it before as well. Um, and Kenneth, brother Kenneth, I do see that your uh, your phone has dialed in uh, and that you have marked that call. So praise God. I'm going to assume that you're okay. He says he's a okay. Praise Jesus. All right, good. And so under the uh, under Second Thessalonians two, basically, you know, if you were to set the the kind of the vision of what was happening. The Apostle Paul wrote in the first letter to the church of Thessalonica, he said, hey, there's going to be a rapture. Jesus is going to come. He's going to snatch us up in the clouds. And, uh, and, you know, and, then he, and he kind of gave, the, in, the, in his first epistle, in the first letter, he kind of told them, you know, what's going to happen? There's going to be peace and safety, and then there will be sudden destruction. And it will come upon them, and they, that's the unrighteous, shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not of the darkness, you are of the light, that this day should overcome you as a thief. For God has not appointed us to wrath. I'm, I'm, I'm basically paraphrasing 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 um, uh, talks about, you know, comes right out and talks very specifically about the rapture itself. Okay, and so, um, and, you know, I wish we had more time to cover this. We have covered it on prior shows. Um, but um, uh, but uh, that's kind of just a little touch of, um, uh, you know, where, what Paul spoke to the Thessalonians uh, in his first letter. Now, what happened was, evidently, um, uh, the Church of Thessalonica, 
uh, actually is kind of a poster child for, uh, in a sense, a uh, metaphorical poster child, if you will, for, uh, you know, some of the behaviors that we see uh, today. Um, whereby um, people were quitting their jobs. I mean, honestly, folks, we get the most amazing emails and communications from listeners about people's behaviors across the world. We spend a lot of time in prayer. But people have even come right out and said things like, you know, wow, I feel like Jesus is coming so close, I'm going to quit my job. I get letters from teenagers, you know, hey, I'm supposed to go to college this fall. Should I continue to go to college? Um, you know, and the answer is always yes. You have to continue on with your life. You have to continue on with your job. None of us wants to go to work tomorrow. Praise Jesus. But, you know, it's a ways to a means. Praise God, you know, whether you're a vine dresser or a tent maker or, or a prayer shawl maker, whatever. Praise God. Whatever it is that you're doing, uh, hopefully you can turn uh, that into, you know, a, a way for you to, you know, to fund your ability to better serve the kingdom, ultimately, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and be a good steward unto the Lord. Praise Jesus. Um, and that that, but here's the thing. The Church of Thessalonica, they, they got – things were upset. They got upset. They, people were quitting their jobs. Uh, you know, Brother Callan knows even more about the history behind it than even I do. Um, but basically, it was kind of a mess. It was kind of a big mess. And Paul went in there, and he you know, had to kind of set the record straight with folks. So he says – you know, he's trying to set the record. He's trying to say, hey, guys, hey, listen up. Listen up. Jesus is not coming for the rapture to take you to heaven. All right? He's not going to come. You didn't miss him. You did not miss him. Everybody needs to chill out. You don't work. You don't eat. He actually says that in Second Thessalonians uh, chapter 3. All right, but in chapter 2, he gives a synopsis. Why, what we need to look out for. The stuff that's going to happen before the rapture, ultimately. Okay, and it's kind of in a little bundle. And it has primarily three items. And without splitting hairs over the falling away, the outbound departure, and all that, I'm just going to take the King James, New King, King James slash New King James. I'm, I like New, New King James because, you know, I just. Personal preference. But anyway, there's basically three things in Second Thessalonians 2 that are spoken of. I'm, I'm greatly simplifying this on purpose. Praise Jesus. The first thing is the falling away. The second thing is, you know, the Antichrist being revealed. And the third thing is the strong delusion. Okay? All right? That's pretty much it. So the first thing is, he says, now, brethren, concerning the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, gathering together, there's the rapture, basically, not to be soon shaken in mind or troubled, either by spirit or word or by letter, as if from us, as if the day of Christ had come. Because, you know, at the day of the Lord, we're, gonna, we're leaving. That's when Jesus is going to come and get us. That's basically at the very end of the sixth seal. Okay, the day, because we're not appointed to wrath, and Revelation 6, verse 17 says, and the great day of his wrath has come, and who is able to stand? First Thessalonians 5, 9. Matches Revelation six seventeen. It's a direct match. So Paul goes on to say, he says, Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first. So there, there's, there's the first thing, the falling away. The man of sin is revealed. There's the Antichrist. So you got falling away, Antichrist. And then the last thing is verse 11, And for this reason God will send them a strong delusion so that they will believe the lie. Okay? One, two, three. One, two, three. And it, and it goes on to describe the lawless one and, you know, the working of Satan and all power signs. The coming of the lawless one is in according to the works of Satan with all power signs, lightning, wonder. You know what? It makes you wonder. Because the lawless one works of Satan, power signs, lightning, wonders. It all kind of seems to blend in to this strong delusion, this description. It's a little nebulous. It's not, you know, it's not a precise description of exactly who the players are. All we know is that there's three major milestones woven into Second Thessalonians 2. Falling away. Man is sin revealed. Strong delusion. One, two, three. That's it. Nothing else. So if you simplify it and you look at it and you go, oh, okay. Well, I mean, why would Paul, if he's trying to explain to the Church of Thessalonica, why would he even mention the strong delusion as one of the things? You know, he starts the whole, he starts that sentence out. He starts the breath out. He's, it's a couple of paragraphs, and he basically says, hey, guys, 
Chill out. Don't be soon shaking her mind or troubled. Let no one but deceive you. Day's not going to come until first. A, falling away. B, Antichrist. C, aliens. Get it? <laughs> A, B, C. <laughs> falling away. Antichrist. Aliens. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> so, anyway, that's basically the nuts and bolts of Second Thessalonians 2. So, I've always wondered, you know, maybe the strong delusion gets slipped in, you know, because there's, you know, I was just talking to a blessed saint uh, earlier today about this dynamic. And what's fascinating is, for all intents and purposes, you know, if you want to get hung up on glossy, glossary of terms, and boy, oh boy, do people get hung up on them. But anything that wasn't conceived, born, e.g., uh, its origin was from Earth, is by definition not earthly. Even Chuck Misler, as conservative as he is on his, you know, uh, belief system regarding, you know, these UFOs and such, he even calls the Bible extraterrestrial in origin, which, by the way, is absolutely correct. Praise Jesus. Okay, so again, is an angel an extraterrestrial? Yes. Is Jesus an extraterrestrial? Yes. The problem is our terms and definitions are all dorked up. Okay, so we're so used to hearing E.T. associated with little gray, uh, gr filthy, abominable, fallen angelic, beastly creatures from the bowels of Sheol that every time you hear the term it automatically defaults your brain over to, you know, just like an angel for some people makes them think about a blonde woman with a heart floating around on a, on a cloud. Angelic beings are of many different species um, it, it's, it's, it's very, it's much bigger. Uh, just look at all the different classes of angels that are out there um, you know, so again um, I, I, I even have a book here by a guy named Davidson, a dictionary of angels that has got hundreds if not thousands of different classes classes of angels. So it's complicated. And we tend to over we, we tend to either make it more complicated and get confused with the terms and definitions, or and then that really messes us up. When we try to take a dorked up glossary of terms and map it back to the Bible, <laughs> we don't know which end is up. So praise Jesus, what I'm trying to do as best as I can, is to help people understand that when you look at the Bible, anything that's not from Earth is by definition an ET. There are angel, that angel, that death angel that was sent to, to, to you know uh, during the original Passover back in Egypt, wasn't from Earth. But it, but in Psalms it refers to it as an evil angel. You've got in Isaiah 13 in Joel 2, uh, uh, sanctified or holy angels that are sent. They're they, they, they're they're being sent by God. You could call them holy watchers. What makes them holy? I don't know. I don't get it. I mean, all I can tell you is that the Bible is very clear. They are sent by God. I mean, listen how it describes them. This is just Isaiah 13. I have commanded my sanctified ones. Well, right away, the word sanctified means holy. And then he says, I have also called my mighty ones for my anger, those who rejoice in my exaltation. So they obviously love the Lord. They are obedient to God. They rejoice in his exaltation. The noise of a multitude of the mountains, like that of many people, the tumultuous noise of the kingdoms of the nations gathered together, the Lord of hosts, Hosts, get it? Hosts. Musters, the army for battle. They come from a far country, from the end of the heaven, the Shamayim, the cosmos. That's the Hebrew word, Shamayim. The Lord and his weapons of indignation to destroy the whole land. Wow. So you've got attack waves of beings that are not from earth. Attack waves. So it appears that this strong delusion is... Allowed by the Father, ultimately, just like in the book of Job, the Lord draws lines of, you know, it says, tells Lucifer he's on a long leash and what you can and cannot get away with, all right, ultimately. And then Lucifer's allowed to do, in his sandbox of permissions, he's got a sandbox of what he's allowed to accomplish in any particular part of the world or whatever during, you know, the Lord controls that sandbox. Okay, and then and then the Father also will be sending his uh, evil angels ultimately uh, to the earth in attack waves, which you see all the way through Revelation, uh, all the way through the trumpet judgments, the locust creatures in Revelation nine, the other creatures that follow after the locust creatures that kill a third of whatever's left of mankind on the earth. 
<laughs> oh my gosh! Praise God! Thank you, Jesus, for the rapture. Oh, hallelujah! Thank you, Father. Anyway, so it's very, very exciting tonight. Uh, Brother Callan has done some fabulous homework, uh, written a book called "They're Coming Before the Rapture," and um, uh, it, it was kind of a supernatural experience that I had, even stumbling over his work. And um, and I've had some conversations with him, and this guy is absolutely anointed. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Kenneth? Yeah, John, there's a lot of uh, exciting stuff there in that letter Paul wrote to the Thessalonians. You know, that, um, that son of perdition, the lawless one, you know, the man of sin, as Paul told the Thessalonians. He's also called the king of fierce countenance in Daniel 8.23, and the prince is to come in 9.26. And I love this one out of Zechariah 11.17. And just listen to this. He's, uh, John, I, I absolutely love this one. Zechariah 11.17, Woe to the idle shepherd that leaveth the flock. The sword shall be upon his arm and upon his right eye. His arm shall be clean dried up, and his right eye shall be utterly darkened. There's another reference to the son of perdition. It's it's really exciting. I mean, I, John, I tell you all the time, I believe we're the generation. I, I just have it in my heart, and we're going to we see these to. things. But remember, Antichrist means against, but in Greek it also means in place of. So he's going to deceive many, brother, many. Oh, yeah, and you know what? I don't even like to get wrapped up in who the Antichrist is going to be. I think, you know, Obama could be one of them or might be the Mac Daddy of all Antichrist. Who knows? I have no intention of being here. I may see the son of perdition be revealed before I, you know, Amen. jet off this alien <laughs> demon infested rock. But at the end of the day, I'm going to be so busy high-fiving all you Amen. people that are listening to this radio show. I'm going to be hugging you all until your heads pop off. Praise Jesus in your sanctified, holy, transformed body. It won't matter. I'm sure I can hey. run and grab your head and stick it back hey, on again. <laughs> <laughs> and everybody, I've been hugged by Johnny, and he could give you a real bear hug, and he could probably pop your head off. So, <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. Uh, yeah, folks, I, at the end of the day, people get themselves all worked up about stuff, and you know what? I don't care. You can go ahead and put on your boxing gloves and, oh, I think it's Prince Charles, and I think it's this. You know what? Whatever, man. You can have the, you win. Praise Jesus. Hallelujah. I just want to get out of here. Because when this stuff breaks, when this stuff breaks, when we see these things come to pass that Brother Callan's going to be talking about tonight, Wow. I mean, we're going to be like, get us out of here. I'm going to be out with my, my, my PA system. If I can't get out of my house because they got martial law going on, they won't let me out on the main road. I got a little a megaphone for my bicycle. I got a you know 10-speed and, and a little saddlebag thing, and I stuck a little mini megaphone in there. So I'm going to sneak right past the soldiers on my bike and go out and preach Jesus. All right, but anyway, because I'm going to bring everybody along I can with us. Hallelujah. Oh, let me just share this with you. I've been wanting to share this for a couple of shows now. I've had it queued up. I keep, we keep running out of time. We don't really have time tonight either. Cause we, but anyway, let me just share this because it's so powerful. When you hear me praying and you'll, say, you'll hear me saying, you know, Father, surround our homes with link angels. Link angels, what are they? I'll, I'll share it with you. If you haven't read yet, and maybe you're not a reader, which is fine. You're an audio Bible person. You don't like to read books. You just don't have time. If you can get this on audio Bible, I, I mean on audio, like an audible or whatever, praise God. If you can't, then I cannot more highly recommend that you read this book, especially now. Why? Well, for one thing, if the net aggregate sum total of the prophecies, dreams, and visions that we've been tracking now for the last couple of years, if the story that they tell is accurate, and it is supported by a lot of prophecies, dreams, and visions, then you're going to need to hone, more so than ever before, your spiritual warfare skills. Now, so I highly recommend... If there was any book, you can't even go into the Johnny Baptist non-theological college. You can't even get into the entry exam. You can't. You know what I'm saying? Without reading this book, this is prerequisite to even coming in to the. You know what I'm saying? So get this book. It's called "He Came to Set the Captives Free" by Rebecca M. Brown, M.D. It is absolutely astonishing. 
praise God. And it was very supernatural how I even found out about this book even existed. Very supernatural story we don't have time for. But I'm going to read you about the Link Angels. Uh, it, this is an ex excerpt from that book. Listen to this. Quote, oh, and by the way, the person writing this right now, her name is Elaine, and she was a, uh, a, a, a mother goddess, a priestess for the Brotherhood of Satan, which is really dark. But anyway, uh, she's telling this story, and, and, and here goes. Quote, it was during the last visit to California that one of the incidents happened that started me on the road to accepting Christ, started me questioning Satan's claim to be more powerful than God. The high priest gathered a number of us together and told us that there was a family nearby who had been interfering with Satan. They had been converting a number of cult members to the enemy, Jesus Christ, and were making a nuisance of themselves. Satan had given the order for them all to be killed. The high priest told us that we were all to go together in our spirit bodies, astral project, and kill them. So we sat down in a circle with our candles in front of us and consciously left our bodies going into our spirits to the house to destroy these people. I was not at all enthusiastic about the project, but I had no choice. If I had disobeyed, I would have been killed. Much to our surprise, as we arrived at the edge of this family's property, we could go no further. The whole area was surrounded by huge angels. The angels stood side by side, holding hands. They were dressed in long white robes and stood so close together that their shoulders touched. They had no armor or weapons. Nobody could get through them, no matter how we tried. Any kind of weapon used merely bounced off of them, doing no harm. They laughed at us at first, daring us to come ahead and try to get through them. The other cult members got more and more furious with each passing moment. Suddenly, their countenances changed, and the fierce look from their eyes made all of us fall backwards onto the ground. A very humbling experience, I might add. I will never forget, as I sat on the ground looking up at them, one of the angels looked directly into my eyes and said to me in the most loving voice I had ever heard, Won't you please accept Jesus as your Lord? If you pursue the course that you are taking, you will be destroyed. Satan really hates you, but Jesus loves you so much that he died for you. Please consider turning your life over to Jesus. And that was the end of the battle for me. I refused to try any longer to get through. I was very shaken. The others tried for a while longer, but none succeeded. I doubt the family ever knew that the battle was going on outside their house. They were completely protected. We called this particular type of special angel, Link Angels. Absolutely nothing can get through them. I was secretly thankful that we did not get through the Link Angels, and it had given me much to think about. In spite of that experience with the angels, it was a couple of more years before I turned to the Lord Jesus. Whew, praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Father. Wow, that's powerful. That's the kind of angels I want around my house. Glory to Jesus. Just, uh, I remember the first time I read that, I was just in tears. Praise God. Kenneth? Hey, Johnny, you know, I was going to suggest that the part, ministry partners I work with, uh, Terry and I work with at Sozo's, Becky and Bill, I was going to suggest to them that they read that book. Do you know what book they were going to suggest that Terry and I read? The very same book, brother. That's a must-read for anybody going into ministry. In fact, anybody who's serious about serving the Lord Jesus Christ. It really gives you a good perspective on what we're up against in terms of the enemy. Oh, my goodness. Folks, it covers everything, almost everything. Oh, my gosh, it, it will completely change your worldview on the... I mean, just listening to that testimony alone. Astral projecting into spirit bodies, having a tangible war with angel beings that are obviously invisible to the people in the house. And then you read Ephesians 6, you know, principalities, powers, and strongholds in high places. And then you read, I think it's 2 Corinthians 7, 1, you know. Is, is that the right verse? I'm not sure. It says uh, that, that, that uh, the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, so we don't use earthly weapons. They're not carnal. The weapons of our warfare, our 
warfare, the bride of Jesus Christ, does not use earthly weapons. They're mighty in God for pulling down strongholds and every uh, high thing that exalts itself above God. Praise Jesus. It's all spiritual. How is it that, you know, isn't it amazing, Kenneth, how these, these, these demonic, 2 Corinthians 10, 4, praise God. Yeah, that's the one holding every thought captive to the obedience of Jesus. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Kenneth. Um, isn't it amazing how we just, you know, we always default to the earthly things, and we just never, we hardly ever default to the spiritual answer, which is what we're supposed to be. We're supposed to be spiritual. And the forces of the darkness, the New Age, what are they? The New Agers are spiritual. They're just talking to the wrong spirits. If Christianity was half of a spiritual, uh, if they pursued the spiritual aspects of Christianity half as strongly as the New Age does their version, this would be a different world. We all have to seek spiritual answers, spiritual prayer, spiritual warfare. That's what it's all about. Praise God, and I just pray in Jesus' name that every every single person that listens to this show, that you understand that we are entering into some dark, dark times, and it's all about your ability to deal with the forces of darkness, with the power of the Holy Spirit, and the power of Jesus Christ in you. It's not about getting out, you know, your great-grandfather's, you know, Japanese saber sword and going and trying to chop one of these fallen angels' heads off. Praise God. It's about binding and casting these things out. And I don't have time to tell you a story. I could give you a story. Read the book Masquerade of Angels, and you will hear how this little old lady in an abduction situation, ah, it's just unbelievable, in the name of Jesus, and they left this, these creatures. They just ran for it. It's Praise God. It's so powerful, the name of Jesus. Kenneth? Hey, Johnny, in reference to this whole spiritual thing, you know, there's Paul tells us there's three kinds of people in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 14, talks about the natural man. Doesn't get any of this stuff we're talking about. Looks at you kind of crazy. Then in verse 15, the spiritual man, that's the born again. And then over in verse 1 of, uh, and, and, you know, there is one other type, like you said, the New Agers, that kind of get it, but from the wrong, like, they're trespassers, like John said in, in uh, like Jesus said in John chapter 10, verse 1. But anyways, then he goes on to say, but there are some of you, you're carnal. Those are Christians who were born again, and they're getting back in the flesh. So they're the ones that pick up their grandpap samurai sword and think they're going to win this in the flesh. They're the ones that go onto the prepper sites and get their house loaded up with AK-47s and all the dried foods. No, no, we're supposed to fight this battle spiritually. Yeah, praise God. All right, now we're going to go ahead and head into the, because uh, we want to try to bring on Dennis Collin as soon as we can, uh, but we're going to go ahead and head into the headlines right now. Praise Jesus. Here we go. All right, praise God. Real quick, a testimony. Uh, all of you out there, praise God for your work. I know that the Lord will absolutely bless you, folks. It is not an even playing field in heaven. We are rewarded according to our works. If you care about where you land when you get there, you know our works will be tested by fire of what sort they are. And according to how they pass that test, you will receive a reward. 1 Corinthians 3, 13, 14, 15. Read it, please, in the name of Jesus. And Jesus also said, and behold, I come quickly, uh, and, 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 and my rewards are with me to give to everyone according to their work. And then you got, uh, you know, uh, James 1, 22 says, Be ye doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, deceiving you. Yourselves. And I pray every single day for every single person that has handed out a Tribulation Now business card. If you want to do something different, God bless you. If you want to help the widows, if you, know, if you want to visit shut-ins, whatever it is that you feel led, God bless you. But if you are one of those people that wants you know, a witnessing aid, just send me an email at jbaptist777 at gmail.com, and I will send you out like a one-inch, one-and-a-half-inch stack of Tribulation Now business cards. Um, and on the back of them, it's got all this kind of creepy stuff that the churches won't talk about. Uh, Planet X, Nibiru, Mega Quakes, Nuclear War, Martial Law, FEMA Camps, New World Order, Guillotines, UFOs, Alien Demons, Fallen Angels. It's all on here, folks. And this is what we... I'm just going to give you this testimony, folks. And I put holy oil on all of these cards, and I ask the Father to treat them like Paul's prayer clause. I ask him to save the souls of everyone who touches these cards, miraculously and supernaturally. Praise Jesus. So just send me your address to jbaptist777 at 
gmail.com, and I'll stick them for free in an envelope, and you can hand them out to people. This person, I don't know who it was who did it, one of the listeners, these cards go all, and I got a whole bunch that are going out, so folks, please be patient. I'm a little behind schedule right now, but the cards are coming. Um, but listen to this. I got an email from somebody the other day on July 24th, and it says, I'm just going to read to you. I've never heard of this person before. It says, how's it going? I decided to go to a phone box today. By the way, that's got to be almost for sure Australia or the United Kingdom, because that's where the, they call them phone boxes. I decided to go to a phone box today to make a call and just happened to find one of your tribulation cards. I found it a bit weird as I have been looking into a lot of this stuff for a couple of years now. Went on the website that was on the card, and it expanded my mind even more. Praise God! Thank you, Jesus! Whoever stuck that card there, you planted that seed. Folks, when you're putting these cards around, get on your knees and say, Father, in the name of Jesus, please water these seeds. Water the seeds with the living waters of life. Water these seeds. Shine your sun. Shine your sun upon these seeds, Father God, and make them grow and bear fruit and bear more fruit in Jesus' name. Praise God. Kenneth? That is so, so exciting. You know, Jesus said in Luke 12, 2, For there is nothing covered that shall not be revealed, neither hid that shall not be shown. And then in uh, chapter 8, verse 17, he says, For nothing is secret that shall not be made manifest, neither anything hid that shall not be known and come abroad. So what we've been, we've been like, you know, graced with the ability with this ministry and all the people that help us, John, to open so many people's eyes to all these things that you don't hear when you go into these churches. You feel like you go into this little, like, cocoon or a Faraday box if you're into electronics, you know, and you just don't have any of this information. But it's so exciting to hear a report like that. Praise Jesus. It is. And you know what? That And you know the rule of business. You know, one person, there's an old rule of business that has to do with marketing, sales Amen. and marketing. If, if one yep. person complains, there's ten people who didn't complain. Okay, it's just a it's a, it's a it's an anecdote if you will. It's a rule of thumb. So if you have one person that walks up to the back counter and they say, "I don't like your cookies." Then you have to assume there's probably 10 people that don't like the cookies but didn't say anything. That same dynamic applies to just about everything. Now that now the 1 to 10 ratio is just it's just off the cuff. It's really not meaningless. But but the dynamic of one person saying something and a bunch of people not saying something is absolutely true. So if this one person found that card and actually took the time to email me, imagine how many possibly hundreds, if not thousands of others, the same thing happened to, but they never emailed me. Isn't that awesome? So folks, believe it. It's touching people. It's changing souls. It's, 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 this is great. Praise God. Hallelujah. All right, let's go ahead and move on. Uh, as in the days of Noah section of the uh, headlines, let's hit them starting now. Praise God. All right, praise God. Listen to this. This is by Rosanna uh, Ubinal. Uh, this is from uh, VOXXI.com. Uh, the Vatican is prepared to make a statement on extraterrestrial life. And I'll just read this to you. Praise Jesus. For decades, the Vatican has convened some of the brightest minds in the scientific community around the world to ponder the possibility of extraterrestrial life and to prepare for public disclosure on behalf of the Catholic Church in case the, uh, in case the existence of aliens is confirmed. Uh, folks, I'm trying as hard as I can not the burst in the laughter because the black ops of the Vatican knows, and they are, they're already meeting with these things, these fallen creature being things, these from the bow, uh. but anyway, it goes on uh, just just to talk about how that they've come out with a number of uh, uh, articles and public disclosures already uh, in preparation for the, quote, aliens, uh, uh, first contact, um, uh, you know, and, and it's true, there have been actually, um, uh, papers that have been released by senior officials at the Vatican regarding their policy on baptizing aliens because they're trying to claim that, you know, well, Jesus created all of them so they can... No, 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 no. That is not how it works. Jesus is the kinsman redeemer. Okay, it's about us, the sons of God, the Adamic bloodline, those who are baptized or the, those those who are, are washed in the blood of Jesus Christ who accept him as the Lord and Savior. Praise Jesus. It has nothing to do with these fallen creatures. They are doomed. Praise God. Here's another headline. How would Christianity deal with extraterrestrial life? 
And oh, by the way, uh, God bless you for sending these in. Uh, thank you so much. Everybody who sends in uh, stuff to the radio show, I read every single email. I respond to every single email unless it's snarky and mean. And, um, and uh, folks, you know, and we try as hard as we can when possible to weave in uh, as much of the material as we can into the show because we are all in this together. Read 1 Corinthians 12 and 13. We are all part of the body of Jesus Christ. All right, quote, how would... Christianity, Christianity, deal with extraterrestrial life. This is by Mark Strauss, Daily Expl- Expl- Explainer. How would the world's religions react to the discovery of extraterrestrial intelligence? There is, of course, no single answer. But for Christians who believe in the redemption of humanity through a singular event, the incarnation of God through Christ, the question poses an especially complex dilemma. To appreciate the conundrum, A good place to start is with the words of Father Jose Funes, a Jesuit astronomer and current director of the Vatican Observatory, otherwise known as Lucifer, uh, who suggested in an interview that the publicity or the the possibility of brother extraterrestrials, warning, term brother, extraterrestrial, same sentence, not good, poses no problem for Catholic theology. As a multiplicity of creatures exist on the earth, so there could be other beings, also intelligent, created by God, Funes told the Vatican newspaper uh, Lesavatore uh, Romano, the Observatory of Rome. Uh, this does not conflict with our faith because we cannot put limits on the creative freedom of God. Folks, we already know that there is a smorgasbord of life forms all across all of the galaxies, all across this universe in different dimensions because Pastor Howard Storm was taken to heaven. He sat down with Jesus, and Jesus told him so. The problem is Jesus also warned him that the creatures that are dorking around with us here on this earth are interdimensional beings. They are fallen angels. That's the warning. All right, praise God. Kenneth? Yeah, and this whole uh, extraterrestrial life debate, it isn't new, John. In fact, it kind of got quashed when the evangelical movement uh, got got ramped up after the Reformation. But, you know, there's a really good book out written by Michael J. Crow, professor of philosophy at Notre Dame, titled The Idea of a Plurality, Plurality of Worlds from Kant to Lao. This is a guy back during the Reformation. And then back in 1277, the Bishop of Paris, Stephen Tempierre, wrote a paper called The Condemnation of 1277. And what he was basically doing is saying, we're getting too narrow-minded in our thinking. This is 1277, John. And he was proposing the plural... Well, I can't talk tonight. The multiple life forms around the universe. So, you know, we get into this little, hey, I'm an evangelical Christian, and, you know, I raise my hand and I sing some cool songs, and my pastor never talked about that. It doesn't mean it's not a a, a topic that has been widely discussed in the historic church. Yeah, amen. And thank you, Brother Chris, for the stuff that you're sending in. God bless you, brother. Um, And I am getting your messages. Thank you. Thank you, brother. All right. God bless you. All right. Anyway, so, uh, oh, listen to this headline. And yes, amen, uh, Kenneth. Sorry, I was getting hit. hit, (laughs) I was getting input from many different directions at the same time, which interrupted. But um, praise God. But anyway, um, uh, yes, amen. I have that book that you recommended. Uh, Folks, this it's like it's just like Brother Zen Garcia said on his um, uh, radio show appearance or recorded DVD appearance with the Prophecy Club just recently, and 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 basically in so many words he implied correctly so that it's the the further you go into the future, the further you come to where we are today, the more these these understandings have been eroded over time. The burning of the Alexandrian Library, the hiding of the Nagamati Codices, the hunting down of the Cathars, the Waldensians, the Paulines, the destruction of the of the of the Holy Spirit and the transmission of the Holy Spirit through the laying on of hands, that was all part of the Roman Catholic Inquisition and the slaughter of the good Christians uh that that, that existed back then. They were that was Lucifer hunting for the Holy Spirit. Any manifestation of the Holy Spirit was referred to as Gnosticism, and they slaughtered the man, woman, and child in all of the villages to try to wipe it out. The problem is, our history is completely dorked up. And so, the, the founding fathers of the churches had discussions back in the 1200s, the 1300s. They, it was commonplace for them to discuss these kinds of things. The problem is, as time went on, Lucifer con- and his minions, con- don't talk about the devil, don't talk about that, don't talk about that. The erosion of these wisdoms has been a target of the devil for 
Well, thousands of years. And we are the victims of it. Praise God. All right. ABC News, river in China mysteriously turns bloody red overnight. This one is really creepy. I've seen a lot of pictures of the lakes and the rivers and the, and the creeks and things that have been reported to turn like this one looks like real blood. Have you seen this picture, Kenneth? Oh, yeah, I'm looking at it right now, John. It looks like real blood. It looks like that scene from the Ten Commandments when Moses was saying, Pharaoh, let my people go. You know, I mean, it looks like a movie set, except it's real. They got those guys sitting on the bridge, the ones on the motor scooter, and it looks like blood, John. It looks really like blood. It's unbelievable. It's got that really deep, deep, dark. Oh man, it's so. Ooh. Man, when these things break loose, folks, it's the world. It's unbelievable what's going to happen. Praise God. All right, now we're moving into the signs and the sun, the moon, and the stars section. Praise Jesus. All right, Capital Weather Gang, the Washington Post. All right, September and July, big cold front to bring stellar uh, weather next week. Okay, once again, we're getting hit with another cold front in the midst of July. So they already had the one uh, that was, you know, something like 30 to 40 degrees below the norms. Uh, and Kenneth experienced that. People all across different parts of the United States experienced that. Folks, this is unbelievable. They're calling them, you know, a cold vortexes or whatever. It's so absolutely unbelievably weird. Um, and they're saying that these temperatures will be producing degree. Uh, 20, 10 to 20 degrees below the norms uh, in a large swath across the eastern United States uh, all the way into Tuesday. So the stuff is real creepy and weird. Here's another one. Earthquakes are increasing in the United Kingdom. Highest level in a decade. Wow. Praise God. Here's another one. Earthquakes are rising in Oklahoma. 2,300 tremors reported since January. What is going on with Oklahoma, Kenneth? Can it? Hey, Johnny, it's, it's the signs of the times, like Jesus said in Matthew 24. John, we've got earthquakes in places we've never seen earthquakes before. You know, Oklahoma, what about Colorado, Johnny? What about Colorado? Remember, he said these will be like a time of sorrow or like birth pangs. We see an increase in both the frequency and the intensity of these events, and he specifically called out earthquakes, brother. Yeah, it's unbelievable. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. This is awesome. Uh, it's it's going to get a lot worse. Um, uh, here's another one. Why is Walmart preparing for a major earthquake on the New Madrid Fault? Okay, praise God. And it shows the actual statistics. It actually shows a heat map of the United States. Here's another he uh, headline. Listen to this. Twelve signs that something big is happening in the Earth's crust under North, North and South America. Praise Jesus. And, it, and so, again, look that headline up or get yourself, download a copy of the show notes from tribulation-now.net if you want to look at these because we just don't have time to go into the details this evening. Another headline. Scientists assure us that the recent earthquakes all, all around the Ring of Fire are not related all right praise god um uh all right and uh uh all right so let's go ahead and move on um and then under pestilence and famine listen to this it's continuing to get worse Chinese officials seal off plague city, puzzling U.S. experts. Okay, so again, this this particular report indicates that there's a lot. They, you know, it talks about the same 30,000 people in the city. Uh, it talks about this bubonic plague virus outbreak that they have. But what it suggests is that they're, they're, the, the Center for Disease Control, the United States, doesn't understand the behavior of the of the Chinese government in regard to this problem, and that is very very scary, folks, because it indicates that they may know something that we don't know in these headlines, then the situation could be far worse than our wildest imaginations could allow us to under... I mean, because, folks, that's pretty much what the Bible says. All right, um, and uh, let me just go ahead and move quickly through some more of these. MERS has mutated into an airborne agent. So the uh, Middle Eastern virus uh, that, that's been air, uh, that, that's been all all across Saudi Arabia and has been really causing a serious problem over there as now airborne. So we can probably expect that one to get bad. We've got another headline from natural news, deadly plague spreading in Colorado. This is a pretty conservative group that published this, by the way, the natural news group, natural health news and scientific discoveries. They're claiming that this pneumonic plague, uh, 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 is, 
getting worse and worse, and I'll just read it. Many aren't aware, but in the Western United States, especially something as tiny as a flea, can transmit life-threatening diseases that can spread into full-blown deadly plagues. In Colorado recently, one of the deadliest forms of the plague hospitalized a man and took out his dog. Uh, Colorado health officials believe the life-threatening disease, the pneumonic plague, uh, was likely trans transmitted by fleas. And then um, it goes on about the water crisis in California. Uh, then again, that's supported at Scott dot net quote headline disturbing NS, uh, NASA study shows water reserves in the United in the Western United States being drained underground. So that's indi indicative of a tectonic plate shift, such that the water table is seeping down deeper into the into the plates of the Earth, and they're actually seeing that from outer space from the satellites. The stuff is just. It's unbelievable, the stuff that's going on. Oh, also, the Ebola problem has increased. The Colorado River Basin is drying up. Okay, so from LA, uh, uh, from Phoenix, Tucson, Las Vegas, that whole area, that Colorado River Basin is drying up right now. The Ebola virus, by the way, is now spread to Nigeria. So, that, so now we have another country that's on red alert and deploying specialists to airports for containment. Okay, that's a, that's a headline. The following first, Ebola. Following the first Ebola death in Nigeria, Nigeria is now on red alert and deploys specialists to airports for containment. So they're trying to stop people from getting off the planes and spreading it into their uh, respective countries. Praise God. Kenneth? And how much of this do we really hear on the, the mainstream media news? You know, John, they have these stupid segments on ABC, NBC News. Send in your cute puppy picture. And we'll select from one every Thursday and show it and tell a story. I mean, John, we've got crazy things happening. Jesus said, you know, nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There'll be famines, pestilence, earthquakes in diverse places. Wow. John, we're not getting this covered, you know. <laughs> no, things the, the things that are going on right now are just so unbelievably out of control. Words cannot describe it. Praise Jesus. Uh it's it's unbelievable. And you it's know not what? Normal. It's not normal. It's just wrong. Wow. Wrong. It's not normal. This is disturbing. Okay, under the New World Order section we have Botched Oklahoma execution proves it's time to bring back the guillotines. Folks, the whole uh, United States of Babylon the Great has uh, been pumping out headlines and, and, news, and articles all over the place uh, in the last couple of days regarding uh, what they're referring to as a moral lunacy, uh, uh, whereby they have a uh, noteworthy uh, 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 justice a judge who has basically come out publicly and stated, uh, I've got headlines on NBC News, I've got another headline on, um, uh, on the Free Beacon, another headline on The Atlantic. Listen to this headline, Bring the Guillotine Back to Death Row, uh, is the headline from the, the Atlantic uh, article. If I were governor of a state that executed prisoners, I'd declare a moratorium for my entire tenure. I wish that the United States would stop imposing the death penalty. I nevertheless find myself nodding along uh, to Sonny Bunch's uh, B-U-N-C-H apostrophe S case for introducing the guillotine. Folks, they're, they're, they're making the argument right now as if they didn't already have guillotines. <laughs> already have them. They're just whispers in the dark hallways. That's all this is. They're being told what to push for. But they already know the people that are being mentioned in these articles are not necessarily – you know what I'm saying, folks? They, the people that are being mentioned in these articles are not necessarily um, uh, 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 knowledgeable about this. All right, praise God. Uh, but they're being told. They're being told what to say. This is ramping up for – beheading of the Christians on a level where it is more widely accepted when people start to catch on to these things. It's all greasing the rails for the New World Order. Uh, praise Jesus. Kenneth? John, are you there? Yeah. Are you there? Are you okay? Yeah, I didn't, I didn't hear anything you said. I was talking to Brother Dennis off in the um, green room, and uh, amen. Amen to whatever you said, brother. <laughs> 
Okay. I don't okay. Know yeah. What you're even talking about? I said, I said the New World Order is taking me out of the house. Help me, help me! And you're oh, like, Amen. yeah. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. <laughs> Praise Jesus. All right, and listen, folks. Um, you know we have. Um, uh, we're going to have uh, Brother Callan's going to call back in a couple more minutes. Uh, we've got um, a couple more headlines we want to get out real quick because this stuff is so important. Praise Jesus. Listen to this. Obama calls for collectivized new world order. And, Kenneth, when did you say he was going to call back? Kenneth? About, about five minutes, Johnny. <laughs> about five, about minutes, five minutes. minutes. Praise God. All right. <laughs> okay. Obama calls for collectivized new world order. Uh, people are anxious, this headline says. Folks, 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 listen, this is major stuff. Uh, le- okay, let me read this. During- now, we already know about the new world order. Most of the people who listen to this radio show know about this. The the What is critical here is that 90 plus percent, if not 98 percent or more of the American population are still oblivious. So, and many of them absolutely adore Obama. I, I could do a whole show on just that alone, how deeply people adore Obama. They will, they'll fight over him. They love him so much, believe it or not. And because of that dynamic, when he comes out and says something like this, it's huge. Okay, and it goes on to say, during a fundraiser in Seattle this week, President Barack Obama called for a new order. Wink, wink. New order. Notice how they drop out the world part. Uh, based around the collectivized system in order to quell people's concerns about geopolitical, there's your world, strife, and the, the economy. And he goes on, people are anxious. Uh, now some of, uh, uh, of that has to do with some big challenges overseas, said Obama, adding, uh, but whether people see what's happening in the Ukraine, Russia's aggression toward its neighbors. <laughs> Hey, Kenneth, Kenneth, it's all Russia, right? It's their fault. Everything's Russia, right? Yeah, that's right? it. That's it, John. Yeah. It's all their fault. And you know what? I can't wait until President Obama, Obama um, uh, facilitates Animal Farm, you know? Uh, we're all going to be equal, Johnny. Yeah, 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 that's right. Just some of us w- will be more equal than others. Isn't that right, Johnny? Oh, my goodness. Praise God. That's that's why the Father, our Heavenly Father, burns Babylon the Great, the United States of America, in one hour in judgment. Doesn't do, it's, it's not, Russia, the, the bear from the north, it doesn't have two chapters of the Bible dedicated to its destruction, does it? <laughs> it's the United States that does. Oh, praise God. Another headline, Ukraine used phosphorus incendiary cluster bombs against its cities, according to the Russian military. I saw the films. Oh, wow. It's pretty dark stuff, uh, dropping fire from the sky, ultimately. Uh, Praise God. Um, Another dead banker, Goldman Sachs managing director, is found dead. Uh, Nicholas Valtz, the managing director in Cross Assets uh, Sales at Goldman Sachs Group Incorporated in New York, was found dead yesterday, this is uh, from a couple of days ago, uh, by family members who went searching for him after he didn't return from a kite boarding outing reports Bloomberg. All right, and and then uh, so there's a whole how many are we up to? What are we hitting almost 30 now or more bankers uh many of them from Chase Manhattan seriously high ranking very high ranking officer level in some cases bankers that are just mysteriously committing suicide. Right, Kenneth? Yeah, John, it's like uh, these are the guys that know what's going on with the derivatives, derivatives, the LIBOR, uh, all the different things that they need to do to manipulate and keep this fiat money facade alive. You know, we've got some major, major instabilities as this whole thing begins to unwind, and they're the guys that that know what's going on, and they're the ones that have to be out of the way, so to speak. It's like we're probably pushing 40 now, John. All right, praise God. And we got Brother Dennis uh, on hold. I see him on the switchboard, and I pray in Jesus' name that he hears me saying that. So I'm looking right at you, Brother Dennis. There is one more uh, uh, snippet that I want to play for you folks because this is absolutely critical. Um, uh, there's, Listen to this. Just let me play this one clip. Uh, this is five minutes in length, and then we're cutting over directly to Brother Callan because this is a very, very important topic that we need to cover tonight. Praise God. All right, listen to this. This is a rarity. So as you look across the country, as you look at the headlines in, in Chicago uh, and, and, and out in uh, California, all across the United States, Atlanta, different places where there are upheavals, where, where uh, people are marching in the streets, in some cases by, it appears, by the tens of thousands, if not more. 
And in many cases, they're turning violent. And it's against Israel. There are Palestinians in this country that are marching in the streets. Okay, folks, it's getting very bad, even here on this subject. And it's against Israel. These, I believe these are promulgated, orchestrated, uh, 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 um, uh, if you will, uh, proxy-funded uh, groups, very similar to the dynamics that were happening during the Obama election process. There's all kinds of creepy, underhanded stuff where the, the black ops are funding these agencies and causing riots to be up all over the world. It's happening right now. Now, listen to this. This is char- This is so rare. This is so rare. It has to be heard. This is Char- Charles Krauthammer on Hannity. And he's talking about setting the record straight on what's going on over in Israel. Listen to this. You know, Charles, I'm having a hard time, a really hard time understanding this president and those that do not have the moral clarity to understand that Israel is a victim of terror surrounded by one enemy after the other that wants to destroy them. To me, this is about American values as well as the values of freedom for the Israelis. And so many people, including the president, don't get it, Charles. Help me out. Why? Well, look, in the mainstream press, in the world press, you really are looking at an Orwellian universe. Does anybody tell you that a week ago, before the ground incursion, Egypt offered a ceasefire. The Israelis immediately accepted it. Hamas said no. There would have been no ground incursion at all had Hamas simply accepted the ceasefire. That's a fundamental fact. It didn't happen in 1948. That's not ancient history. This is last week. You go back just one more week. Who began this? Does anybody imagine that Israel has any interest in a cross-border war with Gaza, that it would be invading Gaza willy-nilly for no reason, endangering its troops. It's already lost about 30 soldiers. Israel has absolutely no desire to do that. And then you hear talk about the Israeli occupation. Does no one remember that nine years ago Israel pulled out of Gaza, taking out all the settlements, all the military, Everything it had in place, there is not a single settler, not a single soldier, not a single Jew left in Gaza. And does anybody remember or does anybody report that when the Israelis left, they left 30,000 greenhouses where they grew flowers and fruit for export and gave it to the Gaza Palestinians wanting to encourage economic development, open commerce and peace. And what did they get? The Palestinians have spent nine years turning Gaza, instead of into a free Palestinian state, into a terror camp with rockets, mortars, and tunnels. That's where all the cement went. That's where all their effort went. That's where all the money went. Charles, I find this morally inexplicable to me. Um, You have Israel as a beacon of of freedom, an outpost of liberty. And what are they surrounded by? Ruthless, genocidal dictators and terrorist groups. I can run through the names and the lists of them. Dedicated to their destruction. Even this very day, we have the, the, the Grand Poobah in Iran talking about wiping Israel off the map again. What would we do in this country? If 16, 2,000 rockets, 1,600, 2,000 rockets were fired into our cities, what would we do if three American students were kidnapped and murdered in cold blood uh, by a group, a neighboring group? What would we do? To me, this is a simple equation, but the president doesn't seem to have that moral clarity. What is wrong with him? Look, I, I would put the weight of this not on the president. I would put it on the media. I would put it on the reporters. I would put it on world opinion. I mean, look at the demonstrations that you had in Europe. Those were blatantly anti-Semitic. Even the president of France had to admit that behind it was anti-Semitism. We know that anti-Zionism is the way in polite society that you can express your anti-Semitism. There are two causes of the bias of the Orwellian discourse. Number one, particularly in Europe, less in the U.S., but particularly in Europe, 
This is rank, centuries-old anti-Semitism, simply with a veneer of anti-Zionism. They attack Jews, they attack synagogues, they hurl epithets and insults from hundreds of years ago from the Middle Ages. This is raw, rank anti-Semitism, which continues. There was a 50-year hiatus in Europe out of shame over the Holocaust, where you weren't allowed to be anti-Semitic. That is over. We are now back to where we were. The second reason, and the more prevalent one among the American media, is simple, rank ignorance. They don't know the story. They do not know the history I just talked about a few minutes ago. They don't know what Israel offered Gaza, what it offered the West Bank. Do you ever hear anybody report that when Israel left Gaza nine years ago unilaterally, at the same time it dismantled four settlements in the West Bank? That was a signal from Ariel Sharon that he wanted to eventually leave all the territories and live in peace with the Palestinians in Gaza and the West Bank. But you never hear that. And let me ask you this, Sean. Outside of Fox, how many news outlets have reported that the United Nations Agency in Gaza has found in not one but two schools rockets? Now, you tell me, Sean, if you try to smuggle 20 rockets into your old high school and you put them in a classroom, do you think no one in the school would have known? The U.N. workers who run the schools know about this. They collaborated with Hamas. And has anybody reported what they did when they found the rockets? They turned them over to Hamas, which will be used to kill innocent Jews. Okay, that was probably one of the best dialogues I have ever heard in regard to the situation. The UN representatives are allowing Hamas to bring the weapons into the hospitals, to bring the weapons into the schools, to do all this stuff. And then they turn right around and make a big deal and wave their hands in the air and go, look, 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 they're attacking us, it's genocide. They're even coming out now and saying that they did not kill the three Israeli uh, uh, young teens. Folks, there's a reason why the Lord in the prophecies has said he's going to wipe them out. Praise Jesus. Kenneth? Hey, it's the Hegelian dialectic, John. Thesis, antithesis, synthesis, or better known to the world as problem, reaction, solution. <laughs> they create these problems. They've got a package solution ready to go, and they move the chip on the board closer to their world organization, their new world order, now Lucifer's government. It's all coming, John, and they've got it perfectly orchestrated. Amen. Praise God. And the whole White House is full of brotherhood or, uh, of the, with the uh, uh, the uh, Muslim Brotherhood uh, leadership. And oh, <laughs> folks, it's game over. It is so totally. And speaking of game over, we're bringing on Brother Dennis Kellen now to talk to us. Folks, where else can you go in the world? <laughs> Praise God. And, and talk about Israel and all this other weird stuff. And now in the same, almost the same paragraph, talk about the approach of the... Aliens upon the earth, huh? Praise Jesus. Thank you, Father God. Praise you, Jesus. Let's bring on Brother Dennis Callen. Brother Callan, God bless you. We're so happy to have you here tonight. Thank you for your patience. There's so many unbelievable headlines right now. It's like we just can't get them out. I can't read fast enough. The, the, the espresso I have is just not strong enough. <laughs> I hear you, brother. You know, it, there's so much going on in the world that it, you don't even have to say that we're in the end times anymore. It's so obvious. Oh, yeah. Amen. It's unbelievable, And and which segues beautifully into um, the book that I kind of, you know, supernaturally stumbled over uh, in in the midst of arguably hundreds, if not more books, uh, as I was just kind of looking around for opportunities, and I, I, I saw your book, and my mouth dropped open, and I was like, because I've been in this, you know, I've been wondering, when I look at the things that are identified in the Bible, I always wonder... 
did Paul mention that as a footnote, the strong delusion? Was it was it mentioned as a footnote, or was it mentioned as a, a prerequisite to the rapture? I, I've always kind of kept that, you know, I don't know, that, that little question mark hanging off the end, wondering. Because, you know, you know at the day of the Lord, you see these creatures coming from the ends of the heaven. In Isaiah 13, you see some things that look like they're not from here, you know, uh, beings that hop from wall to wall and, and all kinds of creepy stuff in Joel 2. And, and, you, and don't even get me going on Revelation 9 and the locusts and all that other creepy stuff. So it's like, you know... There are things that are not from the earth, that are coming upon the earth. The scripture says so. But to hear someone that has done some research, that loves the Lord like you do, that was that was a big moment for me. I saw that book. I saw the title. I was like, my mouth dropped open. I was like, oh, Lord, dear Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, please let him, let, let him respond to my email. I was like, before I even got a response to the email, I was already telling people on the radio, you need to pray that this guy comes on the show. <laughs> Well, you know, it's really interesting. When you stop to think about it, uh, most religions in the world are false, including Christianity. But true Christianity is not a religion. It's a person. And we were never meant to live in the natural. We were meant to live. Christianity is a supernatural religion. It's the only one that's supernatural, and that's supposed to be normal. I mean, Adam and Eve, they walked with God. I mean, they had uh, angels there. They lived in a supernatural thing. They didn't work by the brow, of, you know, the sweat of their brows up. They worked. They were in the likeness of God. They spoke things into existence. They had the anointing. They had the spirit of God. And uh, when Adam and Eve sinned, they lost that anointing. They lost that spirit, and they became natural. And uh, through David, the, it was prophesied that the Messiah, meaning the anointed one, would bring the spirit back. And so here we are in these end days. And we just get so awed by supernatural things, and it's not supposed to be that way. Uh, we're supposed to know that this is normal life, but it's such a shock. Humanity has fallen so far that they think, you know, well, this is it. You know, you live, you're born, you grow up, you have children, uh, you live for 60, 70, 80, 90 years, you die, and that's the end. And then it, the cycle goes over and over. That's not much more than just an intelligent animal, and that's not our purpose. We were pre created in the image and likeness of God to be rulers with him. And it's interesting because what the Lord is trying to teach the human race from the time of Adam and Eve is a partnership. God himself never created anything other than himself and the Lord Jesus Christ bringing into existence without the partnership. Everything was created through Jesus Christ for him and by him. And yep. he... In essence, the Bible says he gave us marriage for us to understand the need for a partnership. Well, you know what, what and, and I want to get Kenneth to say hello, uh, absolutely, and, and, and I'm sure he's going to have questions for you as well. And by the way, Brother Kenneth had worked with, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Bill Cooper's work from uh, back in the 90s, the book Behold a Pale Horse, but Brother Kenneth had oh. worked with him with him directly on the Kaji group. So we're, we're both, you know, old conspiracy theorist guys from way back. You know, we don't even look at it as a theory. We look at it as, his, you know, true history. Um, but, yeah, what you said is actually fascinating because – no matter what you look at, the you know you read Revelation four eleven and you know where it says all things are created by him for him and through him all things you know but but really we are the conduits of the supernatural here on this earth in many in most cases um, you know when when a person is uh, healing somebody they're not healing them the power of Jesus through them is healing yes, them okay. so. So in essence, what you what you said, you actually nailed it because what we just mentioned this, by the way, earlier. Oh, really? That the well, devil, yeah, the devil erodes over over hundreds of years, if not thousands of years of time. The devil has eroded the supernatural existence of Christianity. When you go back to the apostolic era, the offshoots, the Waldensians, the Paulines, the Cathars, and you look at how they behaved and what they believed, they were very 
supernatural in their existence. You know, the transference of the Holy Spirit, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, the manifestation of the gifts of the Holy Spirit, that stuff was very prevalent and pervasive back then, and it was wiped out by the Roman Catholic, almost completely wiped out uh, by the Roman Catholic Inquisition. So the devil's been on a mission to destroy everything that manifests the power of Jesus. Then you had the Azusa Street Revival and, and other major events where the Lord you know, gushed the Spirit forward again and another revival took place, but it's it's been an onslaught for thousands of years now. Well, absolutely. It's, it's kind of, you know, to understand the, the abduction phenomena and alien stuff like that, you really have to go back to the beginning, and like we had talked earlier, and something that you said that really kind of struck my heart, you said, what's their motive? And, and really, motive is the thing. I always just say, well, they've got a hidden agenda, but when you really look at that, but when you, when you look at creation, the beginning, and you begin to understand God's motive, God's purpose, and then you look at Satan's motive, and what his objective is in this war you begin to understand more clearly what's going on. First off, this is not a war between good and evil. And this is not a war between Satan and God. That ended a long time ago, was very short-lived. Jesus said, I beheld Satan like lightning fall from heaven. That didn't last long. This war is between the devil and the human race. And this war actually started when one of the most important, powerful scriptures In Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 to 28, and God said this, Let us create man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion. When he said let them have dominion, that began the warfare, because the the fallen angel Lucifer had dominion here on the earth. This was his domain. When he said let them have dominion, and we know Lucifer wanted dominion, a couple things happened. Number one, God gave up his sovereignty in the earth. He gave dominion to the earth to mankind. That's why if people don't understand that, they'll say, well, if God's a good God, why are babies abused and all this? Because he doesn't have dominion. Man has dominion. That's why God was left on the outside when Adam and Eve sinned. He no longer had any influence in the earth so he began to work with man through different covenants and the only way that god could regain any real influence in the earth is god had to become a man and so when he said let us create man he's not talking to the angels we're not in the image of angels angels are not in the image and likeness of god this was god the father speaking to God the Creator, is who is the one we know as the Lord Jesus Christ. And so when Jesus came in the earth, what was the thing he said all the time? He didn't say, I'm the Son of God, I'm the Son of God. The devil knew that and challenged that. When, when he was baptized and the Lord said, this is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. The first thing the devil did with Jesus is the same thing he does with us. He tried to attack his self-esteem. He said, well, if you're the Son of God, then do this. If you're the Son of God, prove yourself. But Jesus, when he ministered, he did not get his authority in the earth as the Son of God. He kept saying, I am the Son of Man. And he asked the the people, he said, who do the men say that I, the Son of Man, am? He had his authority in the earth as the Son of Man. And we are all children of men, so that's where we get our authority. You know, you see all these things, uh, these movies where uh, uh, the devil, you know, we got foreigners, uh, aliens, I'm not, I don't mean foreigners, aliens coming and attacking the earth, and they're going to blow them away, and we see all these alien shows, and, you know, what to do if they attack us? We may have to use nuclear weapons and all that stuff. Well, that would never happen. Number one, the devil does not have the authority in the earth to attack us. But he puts out those movies in abundance because that's part of the beginning of the strong delusion to get people to accept them. Because if we think they're going to come and attack us and all this is going on and and all these things and we're afraid of them, when they really do come to the earth, they're going to come in peace. And the whole world's going to exhale a sigh of relief saying, oh, they're not here to hurt us. And that's the deception. 
every every everybody except George Sukalos. George Sukalos will be like jumping around going, "I knew it! I knew it! They're our friends! They're our friends!" He's he's the guy who uh, heads up the whole ancient aliens thing. <laughs> Kenneth oh, Sukalos. Right? Yeah, yeah. He's always telling everybody. Uh, he's always telling everybody how he believes that they're our friends, and you know we need to be nice to him and all that. Kenneth, say hello. Hey, hey, Brother Callan, it's good to hear you live on here. And just an amen to what you said about the spiritual thing. You know, it reminds me of uh, that French philosopher from the 19th century, Pierre Teilhard de Chardin. He said, and people quote it all the time now, we are not human beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a human experience. And what people don't understand, the average Christian included, is we don't have the secular on this side, and then on Sunday we take out the spirit man and we go into church we are always operating in the spirit realm. The question is, are what we doing at this moment? Is what whatever we're doing at this moment? Is it a free, uh, sweet fragrance to the throne room, something that God's delighted in, or is it an abomination in His eyes? You know, Jesus, Jesus addressed um, people on this matter at the beginning of John 10, right after He did the whole healing with the um, blind man over in John 9, and He finished with, um, you know. If ye were blind, ye would have no sin, but now ye say ye see, therefore your sin remains. And then he goes on to say, and he's talking about the spirit realm, and he's saying, truly, truly, he that enters not by the door, that's him, into the sheepfold, that's the spirit realm, but comes any other way, the same as a thief and a robber. Well, if we don't come into that spirit realm through Jesus, or we invite spirits in through any other way than Jesus, they're trespassers, usurpers. Like you said, the dominion now is with us, but we don't exercise yeah. it. We don't appropriate what we've been given. So I'm excited to hear what you have to say tonight, brother. Well, thank you. You know, and that explains why it's so critical that we pray. If we don't pray and ask, God cannot move. We must understand the partnership. We were created to walk with God. And so a lot of times, and well, the Bible says you have not because you ask not. And that's so true. And even when Jesus, when, when we watched him walk on the earth, he did what the people asked him to do. Come lay your hands on my daughter and she shall live. Speak the word only and my servant shall be healed. And the whole reason that the Bible was written by man, because man's only got the authority to write it. It has to be done by man. Satan has to be defeated by a human being. And that's why Jesus came. And of course, you know, we talked about, well, what's the devil's motive? Well, we see in Isaiah, he wants to reign. He wants to rule. He wants to be like the Most High. There's nothing in the Scripture says that he wanted to overtake God. He just wanted to set up his own kingdom and take the angels away from God, the angelic beings, to follow him. So his whole goal is to rule in this earth. Well, God already said to man, you have dominion, so there's the conflict. That's why when he talked to Jesus, he said, look, here's all the kingdoms of the earth. I will give you their authority. In other words, I'll let you rule them if you worship me. But Jesus, of course, refused that. Satan thought that Jesus came to take dominion and rule. That's why when he began to cast out, they said, have you come to torment us before the time? And so when Jesus was finally crucified, the devil actually thought he won because he thought he stopped Jesus from taking authority and ruling in the earth and did not realize he was destroying himself. He did not understand the judgment of God. His wisdom was corrupted. But when you begin to talk about aliens, here's something that's really important. The reason I, I wrote this book, let me, let me just back up and say this. I didn't really originally write this book about aliens. Uh, that has never been an interest of mine. Uh, I've been uh, a Bible uh, teacher uh, for many years, been a pastor for a couple years, and uh, two more months I'll be 70 years old. So the Lord kind of said to me, he said, why don't you begin to write down in a book all the things the Lord had taught you through the years in the Revelation? So I started a book, which I haven't finished yet, and it was called the purpose for your existence and the reason you were born. And so to understand why we exist, we cannot understand that without our creator. Why were we created? And so I began to go back to the beginning before even Adam and speak from the revelation of the scriptures and begin to show why man had to be created. 
Well, first off, the angels do not have the knowledge of good and evil. That had to, that came only to man. And one one thing that why that's so important is because although the angels were in the government of God, we get that in Ezekiel uh, twenty eight. Well, the Lord said to Lucifer, you were in the mountain of God. You were there among the fiery stones, which is high authority. But angels, because they do not have the knowledge of good and evil, when sin and iniquity entered the world, they didn't have the knowledge of good. And let me talk to you a little bit about the knowledge of good. The knowledge of good came from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And let me just say this. This is very important. God did not put the knowledge of evil in that tree he only put the knowledge of good when eve looked at the tree she saw that it was good for fruit pleasant to the eyes and one to be desired she thought there is no evil in that and that is the problem that a lot of the human race does they go by what they see instead of by the what the word of god she gained the knowledge of evil by disobeying god and eating of that tree Otherwise, God would be the author of evil. He didn't give it to her. She got it by disobedience, eating of the tree, but she gained the knowledge of good that she didn't have before, and neither did Adam. When God created all the earth, he saw, they saw that everything was good. He said it was very good. They knew the, what good things were. They knew they weren't supposed to eat of the tree. They knew that the difference between right and wrong, but they didn't have this knowledge of good that was in the tree. What knowledge was that? Well, this is the knowledge that you can only gain when you gain the knowledge of evil. And that's the goodness of God that comes through mercy and forgiveness. You can't forgive someone until they've done you evil, they've done you wrong. And so when she part, Adam and Eve partook of that tree, and, and they didn't fall until Adam partook of it, because Adam had the authority to cancel out what his wife had done. That's in the Old Testament. If a wife does something or makes a vow, the husband can cancel it out. But he didn't. He partook of it. So they gained the knowledge of evil and good. They can forgive. When uh, Israel was, came out of Egypt and the Lord says, I'm sending my angel before you and you're going to drive out the nations, he said, don't sin against that angel because he will not forgive your iniquity. He will not forgive you. And so we see that angels now do not qualify to rule the world to come. There's not an angel in existence, not holy or otherwise, that when the Father goes through rejection, can reach out and touch his arm and say, I understand what you're going through. I've been there. Only a human being can do it. Only God and, and us, human beings, have this knowledge of understanding good and evil. And so that became very critical. Now, God had a problem. He's on the outside. His man who he loved is now lost the power, and so we have a problem here. And nobody, not the holy angels, not the devil, not the human race, knew that the human being could be redeemed. The Bible says that the plan of salvation was hid in God before the foundation of the world. So nobody knew that they could be redeemed. So all the devil knew is God was trying to work with his man and help him rule in the earth through covenants and things like that, but it was all to to redeem us where we could have authority in the earth. Now, when we're talking about, when I began to write that book and I got to chapter 8, chapter 8 I started talking about the fall of Lucifer, who became Satan. The word Satan means adversary. And about all the fallen angels with him and what they're doing. And that was just one chapter. But it was so much revelation in it for me that I started doing some more research, and I felt the Holy Spirit impress me, make it a separate book. And that's how this book came out, uh, They're Coming Before the Rapture. That's the title of it. And I began to research testimonies of people who've been abducted. And what I did is I wanted to see, first of all, um, what was going on here, what they were saying, and see if there's any consistency in what they were experiencing. And I wanted to see how it compared to things in the Word of God. And so that's when I began to write that. And at that time, I didn't know anybody that had been abducted. After I wrote the book, I found out that some people in my church that I was their pastor, their daughter and their boyfriend was abducted when they were young. I began 
people began to come out of the woodwork, and these people need ministry. Because when you begin to deal with the aliens and the fallen ones, there's also evil spirits that go with them, and they have a lot of trauma. And so I began to go through that and to get a, a little deeper understanding. And then I began to find out that everything they experienced, without exception, I could find a scripture for. And so I began to put this book together and, and began to write things. I had one fellow say to me, gee, why would any Christian want to write a book like that? And I thought, well, you know, he just doesn't want to shake the bushes and things like that. Then I go to find out that the same fellow, his wife's family, had a uh, flying saucer land in their backyard in, in uh, North Carolina. Aliens got out and terrified him. And he's wondering why... Somebody's not writing a book about that. Don't these people need to be ministered to? Don't they need to hear the gospel? Don't they need to be set free? And, of course, they do. And I began to come across a lot of things. And uh, the thing that really kind of began to strike me about that is how much they're in prophecy. And so when I began to see them all through prophecy and what they're called, they're called the stars of God. They're called the hosts of heaven. Um, they're called uh, uh, sometimes some of them were the morning stars uh, and so I began to find out as I began to go through the scripture they're all through the Bible and Amen. I began I began to realize you know how reliable is the word of God and of course as a Christian and as a Bible teacher I have to believe and put my faith that God is powerful enough to protect his word, and that it is accurate. Now, there may be some things because of language. You know, sometimes it would be good to go to the original language to get some insight. But I believe that the Bible is accurate, and I can base my life on it. And here, here's the situation. Everyone who believes that, we can communicate and talk. Those who think, well, I don't know if you can completely rely on it, we don't have any basis for our belief, our discussion, because I'm going to believe the Word of God. And if somebody says, well, you know, you've got to look somewhere else, you know, because, you know, there's no proof to anything spiritual. There's absolutely nothing you can prove in the spiritual realm. There's only evidence. And that means it takes faith. Just like the resurrection of Jesus Christ, nobody saw it. The only ones that are around when it happened were the guards, and when the angel came down, they blacked out. Nobody saw it. Nobody actually saw him come out of the tomb. That is a faith thing. Now, Mary Magdalene, uh, when she saw him walking around, she thought it was a gardener, but she didn't see him come out of the tomb. And so what we know is when we look to the scriptures, everything is faith. Do you believe the word of God or don't you? And a lot of people say, well, you got your scripture, I got my scripture, and that's where they get in the air. They don't accept all of the Word of God as the ultimate authority. And I know... Yeah, amen, and the, every... the, the also, I'm sorry, the other thing that you run across a lot is you run across this dynamic where there's this constant give and take and debate over whether or not something's metaphorical or not, and that gets into some real serious confusion. I tend to lean toward the literal, but then there's there's like the scripture that you had pointed out to me that got me all excited when we were talking earlier in in the sixth seal and it starts falling like a fig tree shaken by a mighty wind and you had mentioned that that in when you had dug in deep on the uh, original uh, uh, underlying Greek using your strongs that you had reason to believe that those particular stars might actually indicate not comets but you know fallen angels or fallen angelic beings or aliens of some kind um is that can you expand on that for folks because that's powerful because of the i told you about the alternative interpretation of daniel nine twenty seven that i came up with would you share with folks about that real quick sure be glad to well you know you just in, mentioned uh, <laughs> the stars <laughs> yeah well that's going to be a main topic for sure uh, Revelation chapter 12, it talks about uh, uh, the, the dragon, the serpent of old. His tail drew one-third of the stars and cast them down to the earth. And, uh, of course, that's, that's the fallen angels. And in uh, the book of Revelation, it says that uh, um, 
when it talks about the three beasts, the three beasts in the book of the Revelation. Um, and uh, the first one, of course, comes out of the sea. And, and prophetically speaking, sea is always a, a sea of humanity. So that's a human being, and we know it's a human being because he was uh, as if mortally wounded, so that's mortal. But, you know, when you one thing you mentioned, and before I really go into that on the stars, because that's a subject we're going to talk about a lot, uh, you talk about, well, what do we take literally, and what do we take, you know, is figurative and stuff like that. Well, I'm working on a book right now I haven't finished. I should have finished it before. It's about 75% done. It's called Bible Guidelines to Interpret the Bible. The Bible tells us uh, guidelines to use and how we can understand if we're correct or if we're in error or what's correct truth. And I'd like to just touch briefly on those four guidelines because I think that they're the key to everything when it comes to prophecy. When it comes to prophecy, um, the Bible, rule number one is uh, 2 Corinthians 13.1. It says, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, every word shall be established. And, of course, that's a quote from Deuteronomy 17.6 and Deuteronomy 19.15. And that is, there has to be at least two or three scriptures that say the same thing, or otherwise we, we can't really say that we understand what that scripture means. If it's not in there two or three times, then it really doesn't apply to us. And, and I talked to you about that before, like when people used to baptize people for the dead. Well, they thought that, that the resurrection had passed and they were living in the tribulation. And that's because when Jesus came up out of the grave, it says many of the saints were resurrected also and went into the city and appeared many. So the early church thought that the resurrection had passed. They thought that they had missed it. They thought that uh, they were living in the tribulation. But we don't have any other. So that's why they baptized people for the dead. Let me say this. They said, oh, you know, Uncle John, he died, and he never was baptized in water. So they would baptize themselves, trying to do it by faith, saying that was for Uncle John. Well, that was not a correct teaching. That was an error, a misunderstanding, um, because that's only once in the Scripture. So we don't have two or three witnesses to say the same thing. And so that is... Uh, one, like when Jesus died, he gave three witnesses of three days and three witnesses of three nights of his death. Also, when it came to his life, he gave four witnesses. We got four gospels that bear witness of what he did. And so it's not like, well, Dr. So-and-so said this is what this scripture means, and Dr. Know-it-all agrees, so we got two witnesses. It's not two witnesses from man. It's two witnesses in the scripture. And so if... When I was in sales, we used to have what's called the Ben Franklin T. And I really recommend that people do this about everything they believe. What the Ben Franklin T was, is Ben Franklin in his days when he was in the government and he was going to make some decisions, he would put a T on a piece of paper. And on the left side, he'd put pro, and on the right side, he'd put con. Things why he should make this decision, and on the other side, why he shouldn't. And we used to do that in sales, so we'd get people to get their objective. But I think that's an excellent idea for someone to do is put down something like that, say, all right, this is what I believe. This is what I have been taught. And see if you can find two or three scriptures that say the same thing. That's what it means. It means to have two or three witnesses. When Joseph interpreted the dream of Pharaoh, there were two dreams that had the same meaning to establish it was from God. It says this in Genesis forty-one thirty-two. And the dream was repeated to Pharaoh twice because the thing is established by God. And a lot of times when you see uh, people, especially in prophecy, and they put out things, they get one scripture, and they, they get an interpretation maybe of, of one word, and they don't have another scripture to back it up. If you have two or three scriptures, you know you're in the truth. So that's what I would call rule number one. Uh, as far as, uh, and I have some notes here, and I'm kind of looking at them. As far as knowing that the Word of God is so accurate, uh, John said this in uh, John 20. He said, And truly Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. So we know that what's in the Word of God has been handpicked by God handpicked by the Lord to be in there to give us understanding that cause us 
to believe. There's uh, some teaching in this book. I go back in the Genesis. I don't want to get into that now. But that's one of the things. So in the mouth of two or three witnesses, everything will be established. Rule number two is found in 1 Corinthians 2.13. It says, These things we also speak, not in words which man wisdom teaches, but comparing spiritual things with spiritual things. God does not think like we do. He calls those things that don't even exist as though they already did. So when you come from God's standpoint, uh, keep in mind that God is not speaking from the standpoint of time. He does not speak in chronological order, especially in prophecy. When the Lord speaks and talks about one subject, he speaks about that subject all the way to the end of its happening. Then he'll go back in time and say another thing. Like if he's talking about two people, he'll talk about this one person and this event and what happens to them and take them right on through. Then he'll go back in time and say, and this was what happens to the other person and carry it through. And that's where a lot of people make a mistake. They think it's one event happening after another event. A perfect example of that is in Genesis and the creation. When he talks about creation, chapter 1, he describes general creation, creating the animals, creating the lights, and separating everything, and creating man. Then in chapter 2, he goes to the subject of a more specific details in the creation of man and his general purpose and his creation of his mate. Then in chapter 3, it explains the fall of man. Then in chapter 4, it talks about the fall of the sons of God, Cain and Abel. Then in chapter 5, it talks about the first one born in the likeness of Adam when he was fallen, named him Seth. When he was 130 years old, he begat a son in his own image after his own likeness and named him Seth. There are some Bible colleges that I have read that actually teaches there's three authors here because there's three talking about creation in one, chapter two, another creation. Then in chapter five, it talks about creation again. They actually taught that there's three writers. And some of them even believe because Eve's sin in chapter five, he created another woman for Adam and named them both Adam, Mr. and Mrs. Adam, and that was a different woman. That's what carnal thinking does. God does not speak in chronological order. These are not one happening, two happening. These are specific subjects. And so when you begin to talk about prophecy, he does the same thing. Especially every time when it gets being spoken directly from God. He'll speak like uh, when it talks about the seals. The seals were opened by Jesus Christ. Seal 1 was open, and what happened, he talks about the effect of Seal 1 all the way to the end. Then he'll do Seal 2 all the way to the end, and Seal 3 all the way to the end of that. It's not Seal 1 is done, then Seal 2 is open. Then Seal 2 is done, then Seal 3 is open. These are setting the stage. And it's really interesting when you see that the seals set the stage, talks all the way. The trumpets are blown by angels. The trumpets are warning and here's something that's real interesting. The vials, which is the judgment of God in the earth, it's not done by God. It's done by glorified saints, by man. How do we know this? Well, in Revelation chapter 19, John, when he sees these things, he falls down before the angel and says, oh, man, this is something. And the angel says, don't do that. I'm of your brethren, the prophets, who have the testimony of Jesus. He did it again in chapter 19 and 20. We get the same thing. These are glorified saints. So every word is a key. So when we begin to see that, so God speaks in chronological order. All right. Rule number three, and this is the main one. This is very important. In prophecy, there are code words. There are certain words that mean the same thing, every time that he brings them up. But they only mean that in prophecy. It doesn't mean that when he's talking in the natural or talking in history. I'll give you a perfect example of that. Uh, one word, uh, mountain. In prophecy, mountain always means a kingdom or government rulership. We see that uh, in Ezekiel 28. When Luc Lucifer fell, he was on the mountain of God. Well, God didn't just have one mountain. This was his kingdom. In Daniel, we see uh, the Pharaoh see, or 
Nebuchadnezzar seeing this big image. And when he sees the image with the gold head and the silver and all the way down to the toes of iron and clay, he sees a stone cut out of a mountain come and hit the image at his feet, destroy it. It becomes like dust, blows away, and that stone becomes a great mountain. That's the kingdom of God being established in the earth. That's the mountain. When you begin to understand these different words, then when you see them in prophecy, they mean the same thing. Otherwise, it'd be so much confusion. If he meant this one time and it meant something else the next time, no one would be able to understand. Here's the thing about what God had. and I'll, I'll throw this at you, John. If you had this assignment, say you're in the military, and they had you to write a book, and you were to write it to some soldiers and spies in another country, and you had to write this book in such a way that no one would understand it except those soldiers. And in that book, you had to put all the secrets of the United States, all the bank accounts, all the codes, all the movements of our troops, and every secret, but you had to write it in a way that nobody... that with, that read it would understand it except those soldiers that's what the Bible is it's written for us it's hidden from the world they're not to understand it's like you said the adulterous and sinful generation doesn't understand the signs but it's for us to understand uh, I've heard people say when Jesus spoke in parables he did it so he talked about farmers and plants so we'd understand well that's contrary to what the word of God says it says he spoke in parables so that we Christians would understand the things of the kingdom of God. But those on the outside, it'd be parables that in seeing they wouldn't perceive, in hearing they wouldn't understand, so that they won't be converted. Why? Because their heart wasn't right with God. But it's hidden there for us. In fact, um, there's a scripture. Let me look this up here. Uh, I got it at the beginning. It's in uh, Proverbs. And it says this. It says, it's the glory of God to conceal a matter, but the glory of kings is to search it out. So Proverbs God conceals two. things. Yes, that's, he conceals them, but it's our glory to find the mysteries. Exactly. And the, so, and the other one that applies is, be careful how you hear to him who yeah. has, more will be given. The key, the key there is and this this I find this fascinating because Kenneth and I are actually talking behind the scenes because you know your your theological training comes out in how you break out the exegesis of pro prophecy um, and so this is basic exegesis 101 any any theological seminary is going to teach what you just said uh, a lot of the stuff but what's fascinating to Kenneth and I is that we have brought people on the show who are well known. Uh, uh, the, the, theologically trained PhDs, et cetera, et cetera, who uh, basically subscribe to the exegesis 101 that you just stated, um, uh, and and fascinatingly, they they do not see what you see. They do not agree the hosts of the heaven are the fallen angels. They do not. They believe that it's that that it's actually uh, the old school uh, uh, actual planets and stars. So what's fascinating is the key here, I believe, it's not just what you said. It's it's more than that. It, it's it's So it's a combination of the Lord will bring you to where you are able to go. Your intellectual and spiritual capacity has to be humble. And if it's not humble yeah. and you've made your mind up that, oh, it's got to be this way because so-and-so taught it, or I'm part of the Chuck Misler Club and I'm not going to believe that because that's part, you know, and we travel on a prophecy circuit and those guys won't like me anymore and they won't invite me to come along if I don't agree with them on that you know or if I cross that golden line and don't talk about it the way they approve you know when you when you take on that demeanor you break the rules of the kingdom and and where Jesus said in Luke 8:17 for nothing is secret that will not be revealed nor anything hidden right. that will not be known and come to light for th take therefore take heed how you hear that is arguably the single most critical I, I would argue the most critical verse in the entire Bible for coming to yeah. an advanced understanding of the things that we're talking about tonight. Well, you know, it's interesting, and, and I didn't understand here really until just, um, I guess, this last week, 
why years ago the Lord told me, because, uh, you know, I was a young Christian, and especially when I started getting speaking engagements, I'd read, you know, different people's books because I didn't know anything. So I'd read this guy's book, and I'd read, read The Invisible War uh, by uh, Barnhouse, and, and I began to read all these things, and then I would teach what they teach. I'd look up their scripture, and, and it's, what I was doing is just basing saying, well, they're PhDs, they're highly educated, they know more than I am. I'm just a young Christian in my 20s, so I, you know, I had to put my trust there. But several years ago, the Lord told me this. He said, do not read other people's books anymore. Do not read commentaries. He me said, too. I want you j-. Is that right? Yes, yes. Well, about three years ago, Kenneth is wowing me right now over an instant messenger. Kenneth, jump in. How about the Lord has led both of us? You know, we read yeah. some of the ancient founding fathers oh, of, the, of, of some old history, but we don't. We no longer. The Lord said you can't do that. The, I've had people send me stuff and writings, and you've got to read this book, John. You have to listen to this pastor. And I'm like, Lord, you know, I, I knew that in my heart the Lord had told me stop it because otherwise Amen. you are going to have the spirit of unbelief. You're going to be stuck in a rut because you believe what that guy said instead of what I'm trying to show you. Yeah, even more than that, uh, we're in what uh, I call an overlap period. When we're going to, there's a transition. Uh, after Jesus comes, uh, that will destroy all atheist theology, most foreign, uh, false religions will be destroyed because all of a sudden, here comes this being from outer space Jesus to take us home to heaven, and you got all these aliens land. That just going to destroy so many doc- uh, dogma and what people believe. But here's the thing, and and the Lord just showed me this this week. <clears throat> Excuse me. He when he called the apostle Paul, he told him, "Go by yourself. Do not go to the apostles." If he went to the apostles and said, "Well, you know, here's Peter. He walked with Jesus for." three and a half years, and all these said, I can learn from them. If he went, then we would be circumcised today. We would be mixing Christianity and the law. But God had to take him and say, no, you've got to learn something new. And so he brought in the New Testament, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Well, we're in an overlap period now where there's going to be a major change. And so uh, the Lord said in the scriptures, he says, you can't take new wine and put it in the old wineskins because the old wineskins have already been stretched out, the formation when they were used one time. If you put new wine in them, it'll stretch them further and they'll tear and you'll lose it. So therefore, we can't take what prophecy and things have been taught before. We've got to get alone with the Holy Spirit and let him teach us, not by just thoughts, but teach us out of the word. Because yes. we're in that overlap period where there's supernatural things happening in this earth that people don't understand. And so right. we've got to see the scriptures in a new light. So so how did this, if you don't mind, because we're down to the last hour and there's so right. much information, could you talk to us how you got in? You know, I see in Chapter 4 it says, encounters of the fourth kind and then chapter five was actual testimonies from abductees and again folks the title of this book this is dennis callen c-a-l-l-e-n he's got a bunch of books on amazon um but this one's entitled they are coming before the rapture and um would you talk to us about this whole you know alien component and the abductee piece and how it all led you to where you're at with this yeah i, I sure will um, and uh, <laughs> briefly, let me just say this uh, rule number four is uh, the Bible is not just written to the human race. It's also written to these aliens, to these fallen angels. There's things oh in there. Oh, my uh, gosh. I can't believe you just said that. Brother Lauren, are you listening? Brother Lauren, are you listening? We do a show with, uh, called The Peterson Chronicles with a guy by the name of Lauren, and he, you just said the, exactly what this guy's been telling Kenneth and I for years, that, that there are parables that Jesus spoke, and he was actually speaking not just to us with the parable, but there was a duplicitous meaning, lines upon lines, precepts upon pieces, here a little, there a little. He was talking. Yeah, the parable of the rich and 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 and, uh, uh, and, and uh, young ruler. Wow, praise yeah. God. Sorry to interrupt. I just had to get that out there. Oh, I can't help but get excited about the word. L- well, here's what saying, it said. Lauren's saying, yes, he's listening. One, the guy that does the Saturday night radio shows with us going, yes, I'm listening. I bet you he's standing up on his dining room table churning the butter right now going, yes, yes, I'm not alone. <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Well, here's what it says 
in the first chapter of Isaiah, the second verse, it says, Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. And then another place it says, I call heaven and earth to record this day. And in, that's in the Deuteronomy. In another place it says, Be astonished, O heavens, at this. Be horribly afraid and very desolate, says the Lord. Well, he's not talking about the heaven where God lives. There's nobody going to be afraid there. He's talking and prophesying to the human race and to the angelic beings. Even the holy angels, it says they look into the word of God to see what and learn from the church the wisdom of God. So when you begin to understand that, that he's speaking also to the angelic race. And that's why, uh, without that understanding, you get like a perfect one on this is Psalms uh, 22, where Jesus is prophesying his crucifixion. And it says the bulls of Basham are there, and uh, the, uh, the wild oxen and the lions. Well, these are the fallen angels that have come from the area of Basham and are around there to watch the crucifixion of Jesus. They come to mock him. That's why it was dark for three hours around the crucifixion of Jesus. And this would be into the falling stars. It was dark because there is so much demonic power, so many demonic spirits and angels around the crucifixion of Jesus that it just knocked out all light. A lot of people, when they get into Satan worship, when they really get into it, they lose the blue sky. It turns gray, and they live in a grayness of darkness. So we see here that uh, these bulls have surrounded me. Strong bulls of Bashan have encircled me. They gape at me with their mouth like a roaring and raging lion. Save me from the lion's mouth and from the horn of the wild ox. They were there. That was part of the suffering that Jesus went through. They thought they had won. So that's why it was dark in the earth for three hours. And finally... At the ninth hour, at the end of the three hour, Jesus cried out and said, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the darkness ended. God answered his prayer. He delivered him. Amen, now Brother we, Dennis. Let me jump in. Can I just jump in here real quick? You know, and, and that thing that he said, that Paul said to the um, Corinthians, had the princes of this world known, they would not yes. have crucified our Lord of glory. And, and what they didn't know was the promise that we have in Hebrews 11, 39, and 40. You know, Christ in us, the hope of glory, First Colossians, uh, I mean, first, first chapter of Colossians. You know, that's the mystery of the ages. That's Jesus in us. And when people, Christians, get that and they start living with the authority vested in us because, the, the, you know, the prince of this world has been judged, like you said, this is it. This is it, brother. I didn't mean to interrupt, but I got fired up. You know, it's like, yes, they thought, the demons thought they won. The princes of this world thought they won, but Jesus yeah. won. And we have brothers and sisters all over the world that are not appropriating the authority they have in Jesus Christ. Amen. I'll shut up. Oh, no. Jump in at any time. The most, the number one goal, the number one target that Satan is after is our self-esteem. It doesn't matter how much of the Word of God you know. It doesn't matter how much faith you, you, you believe you have. If you have a low self-esteem, you won't believe you deserve to receive anything from God. Our self-esteem is critical. Brother Ken, did you know that your birth is in the Bible? I don't talk about the Bible code. I mean, actually, in Matthew, the first chapter. Did you know that? That's that's new talk. Tell me about it, brother. Fire <laughs> me up. <laughs> All right. When you go to the first chapter, you get the genealogy of Jesus Christ. It says it's 42 generations from Abraham to the Christ. It didn't say to Jesus, to the Christ. And then you go and you begin to count the generations. You count Abraham as one. Then all you have to do is count the begats. Abraham won, then the begat uh, Isaac, that's two. You just count the begats. It says it's 14 generations from Abraham. Uh, oh, let me look it up here. I don't want to get it mixed up. This is an exciting, exciting scripture. Okay. Matthew chapter 1. All right. Genealogy of the son of David, the son of Abraham. So it says it's... Uh, David the king begin or is fourteen generations from Abraham to David. You count them. You count Abraham as one beget Isaac count the begats, and you get to uh Jesse beget David is fourteen. All right? So true. Then you count it's fourteen generations, it says, from David to the carrying away in the Babylon. So you count them 
and you come out with 14. The word of God is true. Then it says, after the Babylon, and it talks about who begot who. It's 14 generations from uh, the carrying away into Babylon until the uh, to the Christ, all right, to Jesus is born of the Christ. You count them. There's only 12 to Joseph makes Jesus number 13. That's 41 generations. It says there's 42 generations. That's verse 17 I'm quoting. So what is this, an error in the Bible? No. The Christ, the anointed one, are those who are born of Jesus. We are the Christ. He is wow, Jesus amen. the Christ, you're Ken the Christ, I'm Dennis. We are the Christ with him. You're in the genealogy. And that's what I have to says. jump in here. My, my pastor, yeah. I had that revelation with what I just got passionate about, the mystery of the ages, Christ in us, the hope of glory. I went up to yeah. my pastor after I had that. This is about five years ago. I was helping write Bible studies. I said, Lee, I think this makes us like, that's our surname. Like it would be Lee Christ, it would be... Kenneth Christ, it would be yeah. Dennis Christ, and he looked at me like, oh, no, oh, no. And I wasn't going to argue with the pastor, <laughs> yeah. but that was revealed to me by Rhema Ward. Amen, brother, you just confirmed it right there, and that's the scripture that I have to go to. But that's the promise, the mystery of the ages, Christ in us, the hope of glory. Yes, and Amen, yes. brother, it's right there, I see it. Well, see, wow. you know, when it talks about you know, we are the bride of Christ, which we are, until the marriage supper then we are no longer the bride of Christ. Now we are the groom. And then you go to Revelation, I think it's 20 or 21, and it says, I'll show you the, the bride, and we got New Jerusalem coming down, which is the headquarters of God, the government of God, the capital of everything. That's, now we are the Christ with Jesus, and that is our bride. We become the kings and the priests of everything. Yeah, It's actually uh, Matthew 1, 17. It says, so all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. From David until the captivity, uh, in Babylon are 14 generations, and from the captivity in Babylon until the Christ are 14 generations. Well, you count them. You know, a lot of atheists say, see, there's proof there's error in the Bible. No, you just don't have the revelation, atheists. This is written for us. We are the Christ. We are the... That's what Galatians 3.13 really says. It says, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, being made a curse for us, for it's written, Cursed is everyone that hangs on the tree, that we might receive the promise of the Spirit. Amen. That's what was promised to the Spirit. That's, see, that's what makes a son of God. The fallen Amen. angels aren't son of, sons of God. For as many are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. What made a human being become a son of God? The Holy Spirit within. When the Holy Spirit comes within, it gives you life. When it comes upon you, it gives you power. You shall receive power after that the Holy Spirit has come upon you. So we receive life. He that's joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. And so, I don't want to get off on a tangent here, but that's a, a mystery in itself. Why did God have to have angels running to and throughout, throughout the earth to see who's walking upright with him so he could show himself strong on behalf because he was disconnected from the human race. Why did, when the Lord came down at Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, I came down to see if it's as bad as I hear it is. Didn't he already know? No. He's not connected to man through the Spirit until Jesus brought it back. Why, when he came in the garden, did he say, Adam, where are you? Well, because he, was dis he noticed the disconnection. But when we were... Back into Jesus, it says in 1 Corinthians, the second chapter, that we have the mind of Christ. We have, nobody knows the mind of a man but the spirit within him. Now we have the spirit of God that we know the things of the spirit of God. We've been reconnected into the partnership. Now, the fallen angels, they don't know what's going on because they are not sons of God. They used to be before they fell. But when you look at Job, the first chapter, here's our two witnesses, it says, there was a time when the sons of God came to appear before the Lord, and Satan also came, and the Lord said to him. Satan was not included in that group. If he was, it'd say the sons of God came, and the Lord said to Satan. But Satan also came. He's not a son of God. That's a, repeated again in chapter 2, verse 1. The, the sons of God came before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. So we see that the devil and his angels do not know what's going on. We do, because we're connected to God. Now, here's they are fallen stars. 
you got to imagine when God first created, now we'll get into the stars because I know you wanted me to cover that. When you, you go into first creation, everything is black. There's no light anywhere except from God. And when God began to first pull out uh, and the first angels, they're called the morning stars because they were the first one created. When you put this light out in the bar, uh, blackness, it's like a star. Jesus is the first morning star because he wasn't created, but he came forth from God. It's like God cloned himself and brought Jesus out of him. But the other angels, and it's interesting, the word kai in the Hebrew is the word used for angels, and it means a violent breath, a forceful breath. They were powerful. But when you get down to the little demons, uh, it's a different uh, Greek word and Hebrew word, which means just a little mutter, a little poof, not much power at all. So here they are. He's creating all these angels, and they're called the stars of God. When he created the, the world, it says the sons of God and the morning stars rejoiced. Why would they rejoice over the earth if it's just another planet? It wasn't just another planet. It was going to be the headquarters of all creation. Wow. Lucifer, was, this was his headquarters because he, when he was cast out, he was cast down to the earth. So they rejoiced over the, the earth. So now we have these angels which are called fallen stars. Now let me look at my notes so I can get you the scripture for them. One thing you got to understand, and, and a lot of people are afraid of the aliens, afraid of things like that because it's unknown to them. Let me say this. I wrote this book for people who have been abducted. That's the purpose I wrote this book, to help them understand. Here's the thing you got to understand. Where did they come from? They were all created by God the Creator, the one we know as Jesus Christ. They were all Amen. created by him. That means they're all subject to him. They're subject to his name, which means they're subject to us. They cannot overcome us. That's one of the main reasons for the rapture, because if there was no rapture, the devil and his angels, when they're cast down here to the earth, would have no power, no authority, would not be doing anything, because us, those of us with faith would go out there and use the name of Jesus and stop them. We have to be removed from the earth. Amen. And so here's what it says in Isaiah. Isaiah 45, 12 says, I have commanded the hosts. They're called the hosts of heaven. It says in Isaiah 40, 26, that he calls them all by name. So wait a minute, wait a minute, he knows. Wait a minute. He, I got to ask a question. They commanded the hosts. Now, are you sure he's not talking about planets? Because I can bring a well-known theologian who's been on Ancient Aliens. I can bring him on here, and he's going to tell you <laughs> it's planets. <laughs> I'm sorry, I had to jump in there. <laughs> sure, no, very good verse, very good verse. By the way, God bless you for bringing that one up. Thanks. Yeah, he he commands the host. I mean, I mean, God's job is not go out there and talk to a bunch of rocks called planets. He calls them all out by name. I mean, uh, <laughs> that's uh, forty twenty six. What did I get? Oh, forty twenty six. I'm looking at the wrong verse. Lift up your eyes on high and see who has created these things, who brings out their hosts by number. He calls them all by name, by the greatness of his might and the strength of his power. Not one is missing. He, every single one of these angels, he knows their name. You know, uh, in uh, Revelation 6, when it talks about uh, heavens closed up, before I say that, let me let me go to talk about uh, the stars falling from heaven because that uh, two witnesses. Okay, Matthew twenty four. All right, listen to the words he used here. Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken by Daniel the prophet standing in the holy place, let the Whosoever reads, let him understand. But those who are in Judea, where is Judea? The West Bank. Let them yep. flee to the mountains. Why? Because when that abomination is set up, there's going to be a great slaughter that goes out from that. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to get anything out of his house. Let him who is in the field not go back with his clothes. But woe to those who are pregnant and those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight be not in winter or on the Sabbath. 
For then there will be great tribulation, such as not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. That's the wording that's always used to describe the great tribulation. It starts with the revealing of the Antichrist. And unless those days be shortened, no flesh would, would survive. Then you go down and it says in verse 29, oh, well, let me back up. Verse 28, this is so cool, 27. There, 26. Therefore, if they say to you, look, he's in the desert, do not go out. And look, he's in the inner rooms, do not believe it. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so will also will be the coming of the Son of Man. For wherever the carcass is, there the eagles will be gathered together. You know what that says in the Greek? It doesn't say the word eagles. It says wind, like what an eagle would fly on, uh, in, uh, inspire. That's the word, inspire. It says wherever the carcass is, the wind will inspire. What's that mean? Well, when a person dies, they expire. They pass oh. out their last breath. So what he's saying here, where the carcass is, there's going to be a wind that it will inspire and give them life. That's wow. the resurrection. And then he says, immediately after the tribulation of those days. You've got to take every word. It's not immediately after the tribulation. This is where a lot of people think the rapture is at the end of the tribulation. After the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give her light, and the stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. God lives in the third heavens. The fallen angels live in the second heaven, or as the book of Revelation says, in the midst of heaven. They live there. So those powers of the heavens will be shaken. And these stars, which is Revelation 12, says that the stars will be cast down to the earth. They will come down here on the earth. That's one witness that that happens. Then we go to Mark to get the second same witness. And Mark says, chapter 13, so when you see, when who sees? When you see. He's talking to his disciples. He's not saying when this is said, we're going to see this happen. This happens just before Jesus comes. When you see the abomination of desolation, spoken by Daniel the prophet, standing in the place where it ought not, let the reader understand, let those who are in Judea flee the mountains, go on, so on and so forth. Then he goes down and he says there are going to be many false Christ. Then he said, but in those days... After that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. The stars of heaven will fall, and the powers of heaven will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and great glory. All right, here's where, let's go to the sixth seal in the book of Revelation, chapter 6, and this is where that takes place. And then we're going to get a second witness in the book of Isaiah. The book of Isaiah is it's got everything from the fall of Satan right on to the new earth. All right, here's the sixth seal. And I looked and he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black like sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood. Why did it become like blood? When you have all these demonic things in the air, it bends the light rays like at sunset and makes the sun turn red. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a tree drops its late figs when it is shaken by a mighty wind. Here we have the shaken. And the sky, this is the New King James, the sky receded like a scroll when it is rolled up. In other words, it was closed. And every mountain and every island was moved out of its place. Everything is shaken. And the kings of the earth, great men, rich men, commanders, mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. Why? Because this seal opens up and sets the stage right onto the coming of the Lord. And said to the mountains and to the rocks, fall on us, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Why is the world afraid? Because we preach that the rapture's coming, and after that is the tribulation. The world didn't believe it, but when the rapture takes place, they know they're in the tribulation, and they're going to face his wrath. Therefore, these unbelievers are now afraid. All right, let me give you a second witness to that, which is found in Isaiah. Look at my notes here.
Okay. Isaiah 34. And here's what it says. And the host of heaven will be dissolved, and the heavens will be rolled up like a scroll. All the hosts shall fall down as a leaf falls from the vine, as fruit falling from the fig tree. My sword shall be bathed in heaven. This is when the fallen angels are forced out of the second heaven. That heaven is closed up where they live. They can no longer hide from us. Now they're going to become visible to the human race. And so the, and this, it's like a leaf falling. That's a soft landing. Why do they come in flying saucers? They have, we have to accept them. So they're coming down in something that we can accept. They come down to the earth, and what they're telling all these abductees is that the rapture, they don't call it the rapture, is they're taking the people that resist them, that don't go in harmony with the earth, out to another place to save them, to start another race on another planet. And they're, what they're doing when they're abducting these people, they're taking the sperm from the men, the eggs from the women, and they're creating flesh bodies. They're trying to duplicate what Jesus did when he became incarnate. Of course, they can't do that because they're not going through the birthing process. But here's the great delusion. They make these little beings, and they're working to get their spirits in them. And they've been doing this for years, and now they become very prof profound and very proficient at it. So here's the great delusion. Imagine this. We got a shaking in heaven. We got the Antichrist sets up. We know he's the Antichrist. And all of a sudden, there's an alien landing, and they work with the Antichrist. They have to work with the Antichrist because he's the one with the authority in the earth. Daniel chapter 9, that says that, talking about this Antichrist, that he shall cause some of these stars to fall, and he will trample them underfoot. Even the Antichrist, who's of Satan, will defeat some of these aliens. Nevertheless, they come down, the world's afraid, and they said, no, we're coming in peace. We do some miracles. We do some things, that healing, because they, they pull out the evil spirit that's in them, and they do some healing. The race begins to accept them. They said, now look, we're your crea creators. You, we spawn life in the earth, and we will prove it to you. They'll bring forth this alien being that's a hybrid that said, take some of his blood. They will take our educated, highly Intelligent scientists will take their blood, go run a test, and it will have human DNA. And they will say, see, that's proof that we are your creators. And that's the great delusion. That's the lie that they cannot. It's so strong because they have scientific evidence. They will accept these aliens. They'll accept them and give their life to them. And they'll work with the Antichrist. And it says in the book of uh, Revelation that uh, the the first one that comes up out of the ground, which is the second beast, we call him the false prophet. What's a prophet? He's one that goes between a god and a human race that can't approach him. He's the false prophet that gives honor to the Antichrist, which is the one that comes out of the sea, which is the first one that has the mortal wound. We know he's human. And then you've got the second beast, which is found in Revelation chapter 20, in which the whore, the mother of whores sits on. Whores always represents uh, being uh, uh, seduced. It represents the mother of false religions, and this beast comes out of the pit, and it says the whole world will marvel when they see him. So that's the great delusion. And so that comes, we are then, Jesus said immediately after the tribulation of those days, when the stars fall, it becomes so black like it was in the crucifixion of Jesus when all those angels were around him. It's dark for three hours. There will be so much blackness here. And when you begin to read these testimonies, and they show these abductees in vision the darkness that covers the earth. And they say, oh, it's terrible. You people are ruining the earth. They don't talk about you loving one another. They want the planet back. Take care of the planet. And they show all this darkness and things begin to die and all this horrible thing. That's right. And when it's dark like that, there's only one light that's going to appear in the heavens. And that's the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, coming back. And every eye will see him. And they'll give the delusion, no, 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 that was one of our people, that was one of our flying saucers, we beam them up, we've took them out, and that's what the world's being prepared to believe. Wow, so, so, the, um, so what were some, I mean, what was the, can you give us some examples of uh, 
you know, some of the testimonies that you got that you were able to map back to, you know, the yes. Bible and these, yeah. Yeah, let me, let me, I'm going through them now. Um, here's one, um, this person says, it was the strangest thing I've ever seen. One minute, they're not there, and the next minute, they break through a, a crack or a slit right in front of me. It's like they were there in front of me all the time, but I couldn't see them until they came through some kind of dimension barrier beyond the veil. That's their words. Wow. And, and then, uh, let me go Let me go through the book here. Let me see what I can pick up. Oh, here's one. Listen to this. There seemed to be something like a TV screen by the examination table. The alien told Judy to look at the screen. When she saw what she saw angered her. On the screen was a scene of her and Mikey, her son, playing together. One of the beings staring at her was extremely interested to see how she reacted. Then the scene changed to a picture of Jesus. Again, her reaction was studied very closely. They were interested to see her reaction of the image of Jesus Christ. But Judy showed no interest. Why Jesus Christ? Why didn't they show her Mohammed or someone else? It's Jesus what they're afraid of. Right. Okay, let me see another. Oh, Paul's voice became monotonous as someone else was speaking through him. He sounded like an alien was speaking. And I put in, this was probably an evil spirit speaking through him. We, st we are studying the brain's chemistry to help us understand how people react to seeing us for the first time. So we will know when the time is right for us to manifest ourselves. We measure the shock effect on the brain, the voice continues, so that we can tell better how to control the shock level. We are in tune with the level of shock that they are experiencing. And if we can control the shock process, then the human being will be ready for us to make a landing. At this point, Paul's voice returned to normal. He said, they need to learn how our brain reacts before we see them. They're going to be forced down to the earth. They also said that they, they don't remember what happens, that memory is taken from them. And in 2 Corinthians 4.4 4, it says, and the God of this world blinds their minds. So he blinds their minds. The scripture shows them that he blinds their minds. Wow. Let me see. Let me find another going here. I just turn through it. Okay, Rick did not remember actually coming into the spaceship. He heard voices telling him not to be afraid. That's when he noticed little alien beings about his size. They were joking and horsing around with each other and just having a good time. They were doing this without making any sound. Like little children, they just wanted to play. These beings always speak through telepathy. Uh, the grays, the ones with the small mouth, never speak words. They always speak through telepathy. And we know that's the way communication is done in the realm of the spirit. The devil speaks to our mind through telepathy. He speaks. He does. We don't hear him audibly. God speaks us through the Holy Spirit to our spirit. It's through telepathy. Okay, these little beings were acting very playful, trying to get Rick, and Rick was a little boy, to relax because of the dreadful and very serious things that he's about to show him. Some darker beings began to reveal to him green meadows with tall trees, birds singing, winding streams full of trout and blue sky. But soon it's all going to be covered with a big, black, heavy cloud of darkness. They wanted to impress on me what it's going to feel like to experience this. The massive darkness is going to cover the entire earth and block out the sun. Things are going to die. And when he asked why he wanted me to know this, he said they wanted me so that I would be one of the ones that could save them and help other people to accept this. They don't want to lose the earth. Rick continued, they think we're idiots and real stupid. The only way that we can avoid this destruction is by getting us to listen to them, they believe. However, they really want us to, don't want us to live on the earth. They want to use us while we're here. The whole planet will suffocate from this huge black cloud, and they plan on using it, as many diseases as they can to get rid of the human race. They feel that they want us to understand this completely. Wow. That's the tribulation. That's what's coming. And then you get this other one where uh, they mock the Bible. And they said, oh, you know, it's not accurate. And it says in this one book, it says, Satan plans to turn brother against brother until man no longer exists. 
The aliens play good cop, bad cops. They talk about the bad aliens. Don't listen to them. They'll make you afraid. We're the good guys. We're here to help you. And we come to, and the fact is one alien appeared to this woman like a, like Big Bird, you know, the kids program, only he was blue right. instead of yellow. And she wanted to hug him. And what? he says, we, yeah, he said, we're really formless. We're spirits, but we take forms that you will accept. And another thing, they oh. use curse words. They use the F word in other words. There's, these are fallen beings, and they're going to be forced to the earth. Here's the thing about, when you read about the fall of Lucifer in Isaiah chapter 14 and Ezekiel 28, when you get down to his final state, the people in hell say this, have you become as weak as we are, you who shook the nations? The fall of Lucifer, because the Spirit of God has been withdrawn from him and all the angels, eventually come down that they become as weak as a fallen human being before they go into the lake of fire. Now, the thing that's interesting about the beast I told you about, those last two beasts, one comes out of the earth, one comes up out of the pit. These are not human. It says the world will marvel when they see them, but they're thrown alive in the lake of fire because they're not human beings. The Antichrist is destroyed without human beings by the Lord. It, we're there. Why would these angelic beings spend so much time abducting people, getting them ready? And they abduct people. They've abducted people in our government. They've abducted people in movie business. How do we know this? Because these people get together and they keep everything secret. They don't want their reputation ruined, and they use their uh, of influence to get the world ready for the fallen stars that will fall to the earth. One third of the stars will fall to the earth before Jesus comes. That's the last sign before the rapture. And when Jesus talks about that, then you go and he says, then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins, five foolish that were left, five taken. Jesus taught and warn his disciples, be ready for the rapture, because only what he taught, only 50% of Christians will be ready and go in the rapture. He taught that there when five versions were ready and wise, five are foolish left. He talked that there'd be two in the field, one taken, one left, two in a bed, one taken, one left. The warning is still to Christians. Watch your life. Watch and pray. Watch what? Watch your life. Watch your spiritual life. If you get caught up in the world, you'll lose your oil. You'll be left behind. And then when you go into the tribulation period, you get, well, these people begin to repent, and they get to the point where they get so strong for Jesus, they'll give their life. And I remember the, the movie China Cry this, about this Chinese girl. She was just living mediocre, but when they took her to prison and said, deny the Christ, she got so strong in her faith, she would not deny it. She beat them. And that's the way the tribulation saints are going to be. And the, the good news for the tribulation saints is they that know their God shall do great exploits. God will move on their behalf. The earth will swallow them up. When the man child is born, taken to heaven, the church, which still, the, the devil goes after the offspring of what was left, and it goes underground. The, the, uh, uh, so was a sea or not a sea, but a water is put from the earth. The earth opens up and swallows water. They hide. So there's going to be a lot uh, of Christians become strong. And Jesus said they will die and give their life. It says this in Daniel, that they may be refined and worthy to wear white. So in the tribulation, and Ezekiel says this, I will judge the shepherds because they're not preparing the people. Then I will turn towards my little ones and two-thirds shall die and be cut off, and one-third I'll bring through the fire. And he goes on, and as long as these Christians in the tribulation move in faith, the Lord will protect them, but they'll get finally to the point that they're given into the hands of the Antichrist, and they lose their power, they become powerless and destroyed, and that's when Jesus comes back to the earth and sets up his kingdom. Wow. Glory to God. <laughs> There's yeah, a lot of information God. there. And all this and, is in the book. Well, you know, you had mentioned something when we were talking on the uh, on the phone that you don't think the two witnesses are a couple of bearded Hebrews that stand on a corner in Tel Aviv and shoot fire out of their mouths for three and a half years. Who do you think they are? Well, the Bible tells us who they are. Let me go turn to Revelation. And it's like I said, rule number three 
is the Bible speaks in codes. Whatever words he uses, it stays the same. And so we have Jesus. Uh, I am Alpha, I am Omega, the first and the last, and what you see right in the book, and send it to the seven churches, which is in Asia. And then he goes and he says, uh, the things that you know, the mystery of the seven stars that you saw on my right hand. Uh, the seven stars are angels here, back to angels of the seven churches, and the seven lampstands. This New King James, the uh, regular King James says candlesticks, which you saw are the seven churches. And then he goes through the seven churches and talks to these lampstands or candlesticks, and Five of them he finds fault with. Two of them are faithful. And then you go down to chapter 11, and it talks about the two witnesses. And it says, uh, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy 1,260 days. There's the days of the tribulation. Clothed in sackcloth. These are two olive trees. Trees are always a sign of men. Trees of righteousness were called. Olive trees always represents the anointing. And two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. Lampstands are two groups of believers. They're the two churches that were faithful. Those two churches, like we said before, uh, there's seven stages of churches in this last day where the day of the church of the Laodicean, you'll see all seven in every group, but this is the end time. But two, during this time, there's still those that are spirit-filled, on fire for God, believe the word of God, and they will be his witnesses until he comes. And when you get down to the seventh trumpet, what you find in the, the seventh trumpet is the earth is reaped. The harvest is reaped. You find the 144 in heaven. You find all those up to that time in heaven. Uh, in verse 14, or chapter 14, verse 17, the grapes of wrath, that begins the, the bold judgments. The bold judgments are done by glorified saints. They're now no, the temple in heaven is open. So they are two, uh, and the same thing with the 144,000 that speaks for that. That's not Jewish evangelists, because the firstborn of Jews is Reuben. That's natural Israel. The firstborn of the 144,000 is the tribe of Judah, and we are all born of the line of the tribe of Judah. These are sealed saints that begin to witness. They're the two candlesticks. Okay, okay, so That's you're saying they're, they're glorified saints. No, not glorified. They're sealed protected, anointed. Okay. They're not glorified until we go into heaven, which takes place at the seventh trumpet. That's when they're seen in heaven. Okay. Oh, praise God. <laughs> I, 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 love it. I love it because anything anything that's not, that doesn't say it's Elijah, Elijah and Moses fighting with an Abrams <laughs> yeah. A1 tank, you know, by shooting fire out of their mouths, you know, I'm like, wait, 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 that just doesn't make sense. Uh, and, and actually what, you know, your understanding of this um, matches uh, very closely um, uh, and, and pretty much lines up with the 80-20 rule of, of some of the things that we were shown, uh, you know, here through prophecies and, you know, the analysis of prophecies, dreams, visions, and some other things that were shown to us um, from uh, from another ministry years ago. I can't get into all the supernatural sure. uh, nature of, you know, the coincidences that, oh my gosh, that epiphany that you have when you're praying about something and the Lord shows you something and it's just, you, you know it's the Lord, you know, because the timing is impossible. Um, praise God. So, oh, another thing that you were talking about with me, um, oh, and before before I mention this part, I also wanted to share with folks, in alignment with um, what Brother Kellen was saying about uh, the uh, the sixth seal. You know, I'll just go ahead and read this real quick. It says, and I looked and I opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth. As a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Now, Brother Callan argues that those stars, which I've heard this argument before, by the way, not quite like uh, Dennis is putting it, but I've heard an argument in the past that these stars were not comets, that they were referring to something else. I have heard that argument. I find that to be very fascinating, folks, and here's why. Because a number of years ago, I think it was going back, oh my goodness, probably to 2007. 
I was digging in. I, it was back when I was starting to have a real hard time with the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine. Um, I was just seeing so many flaws in it, and I was doing a lot of super deep dive research on the scripture, whereby you take the Strong's, you question the meaning of the scripture as it was translated by the people who did the original translation, and you look at it and you say, wait a minute, that just doesn't make sense. And you, you break out your Strong's and you say, let me take a look at what the actual Hebrew words mean according to the Strong's. So you question what the prior scholars, because they didn't have, back when they made the determination of what the most appropriate word might be, they didn't have the, the amount of data that we have now. So our glossary of terms, our portfolio of information is expanded many times a magnitude over what they had when they did these original translations. So um, back when you go to Daniel 9.27, which is the break point, uh, it's, the, it's the 70th week of Daniel, 70 weeks. Uh, it's, it's the last week, and, it's, and it's, you know, it's the break point of the Great Tribulation. And fascinating, it says, but in the middle of the week, that's the that's that line in the yeah. sand when the Great Tribulation yeah. begins, the last three and a half years, 1,260 days, times, times, half a time, 42 prophetic months. All right, that moment in time, there's a, it, it says, it, there's a little statement here. It's the very last sentence of Daniel, Daniel 9, 27. It says, on the wing of abominations, now think about that, on the wing of abominations. Wing of abominations, hello? Anybody listen? It, this is, does not make sense. I'm going to read the whole thing. On the wing of abominations shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. Folks, look, I wasn't born in a barn. That does not make sense. That is, there's, no matter how you slice and dice it, this is a butchered translation. Praise Jesus, there's no way this does not wash. This does not wash. And I took out my strongs. I was praying. I was like, Lord, I knew about the aliens. I was already deep dive researching alien abduction testimony. Uh, just really deep into it. I got so deep into it that I practically had a nervous breakdown when I realized what they were doing to the kids uh, in, in, in the, in the, you know, and it just the awful, horrible things that they're doing to people. But, but anyway, when you look at the second half of verse 27, and you just line up the Hebrew words with your Strong's, that could just as easily be translated into the following sentence. On the wing of a flying army of especially detestable and disgusting things shall be that which astonishes, devastates, and stupefies, which maps over to Luke 12.36, I think it is, where it says, uh, and men's hearts will fail them for those things which are coming upon the earth. Upon yeah. the earth. Okay, and what's fascinating is this split second, and again, you know, without splitting hairs over the actual timing of all this, um, but I just find it, fa I personally believe that that moment in time, that wing of a flying army of uh, disgusting things, astonishing, devastating, and stupefying mankind, lines up timeline, prophetic timeline-wise, with what you were pointing out in Revelation chapter 6, verse uh, 13, where it talks about uh, the fig tree, you know, the, the uh, stars falling from heaven like a fig tree drops its, you know, like shaken by a mighty wind. Those two things line up. So if you're right about the interpretation of the stars in, 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 um, in the sixth seal, being these beings coming down upon the earth, like obviously and evidently great numbers, it appears, that sure sounds like a lot to me when it says stars falling from the heavens. That, that just implies yeah. in my mind that's a bunch. And I've heard people say things like, oh, there's going to be a fake alien invasion and, and you know, the, the black ops and all the people in the secret, you know, deep underground military, they're, they're planning on putting together a fake alien. I'm like, no, it could be nothing fake about it, folks. It's just going right. to be so huge. The whole world's going to be going, what is going on here? People are going to be freaking out. Men's hearts will be failing them for fear of those things which are coming upon the earth. Um, I'd love to hear you comment on that, and then also talk a little bit about the prophetic... You, you mentioned prophetic movies that are out there right now that kind of underscore this dynamic a little bit. Well, it, it, it kind of looks to me like a lot of the people that are producing these movies uh, have been uh, abductees. I, I couldn't prove that. They don't say that. 
um, especially the ones that, I mean, look at, you turn on, we have cable, you turn on cable and there's alien files, alien history, all, these are regular everyday programs. You look, there's uh, monsters and aliens, cartoons. There was a commercial out about this satellite dish, this company that is so fast, it's from out of this world, and they had a gray, a little cartoon gray in the commercial. It's trying to get the world ready because these aliens are coming down, these fallen angels are coming to the earth, and they don't have any choice. The second heaven is going to be closed up like a scroll. It's going to be closed. They will not be able to hide anymore. And Satan's greatest deception is to be able to hide. But what's he going to do when we can see him? He's got to give a lie that's so strong that they will believe it. And so they're coming down to the earth. And it, we've got, what, a little over 7 billion people on the earth. And if two-thirds are going to die... That's a bunch in the three and a half years. And what I say about the tribulation, to me, I call it equal time. Jesus walked on the earth three and a half years. He's given the devil three and a half years with the human race if he can overcome them. And he won't. We'll overcome him. And so these beings, we're not just human beings living, dying, and somebody takes over, and then our grandparents, and then they die, and then somebody's born, and we go into nothing. We have a greater purpose than that. We are created to sit with God in the throne, to judge angels. Angels don't have the knowledge of good and evil. We do. We, have, we are learning by experience two things. Number one, the destructiveness of sin. And number two, we need our Heavenly Father. We need the Lord Jesus Christ in partnership to do anything. We can't do it ourselves. So these things are coming down to overtake the world. Satan wants his world back. That's what he tells all the abductees. Take care of the earth, take care of the earth, take care of the earth, because he's coming down. Now, when you talk about uh, Daniel's seven, seven, seven week, seven, one, 70th week, seven years, people have to realize that, that the purpose of that seven-year period is to deal with the Jews, not deal with the earth. He's dealing with us during that period, but listen to what it says. Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. That's why the big thing's going on about over in Israel right now, and, and you were talking about that before. God made three promises to the Jewish people after the flesh, only three. Every other promise made to Abraham and his seed is the Christ, which we are. If you be Abraham's, if you be Christ, then are you Abraham's seed. But the three promises he made to the Jewish people, regardless of their faith and regardless of how they live, will come to pass. Number one, the Messiah will come from the seed of David. That was fulfilled. Number two, this land will always be your inheritance. And number three, which goes right along that, you will always be a people before me. You will never be able to destroy the Jewish people nor take their land because then God's word would be void. That's why what ever comes against Israel, it's not that they're the chosen people anymore. They're antichrists. They won't even say the name of Jesus. But God made a promise to the forefathers, which are still with him in heaven, and that promise that, that they will always have that land, regardless of what their faith is, regardless of what their walk is. So therefore, we see this come down, and that's why Jesus will return to Jerusalem. That's going to be the, the center of his rule. So, what these angels, that's why they have to abduct people. They have to get the world ready. Because if we really panic at them, they can't take over because we're the ones that have dominion. And that's why the rapture takes place. That's why we're taken out of the earth. So that has to come to pass. That's why Jesus said, uh, the stars will fall from heaven, and I'll shake the powers of heaven, then they will see me coming. And then I'll send out my angels to the far part of heaven to the farthest part of the earth and gather my elect. That's the rapture. But that has to be explained, and that's why they're abducting people. They say, no, no, there's going to be, and I hear this on TV, there's going to be spaceships in place to take the people out. That's the lie they're going to say. We see all these movies, and most of the movies are showing aliens attacking the human race so that when they really come in peace, the world will exhale, accept them, and say, hey, they're more further advanced than we are. We can learn from them. 
And that's why. And even the Catholic Church says, well, we're going to see if they are saved. They want to preach the gospel to them. They don't know who they are. But we know. Jesus said we will know the signs of his coming. The world will not know, but we will not be ignorant because we are children of the day. Amen. Did I cover it? That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Praise God. That's right. We, we are not children of the darkness. We are children of the light. That this day should overcome us like a thief. Glory to Jesus. Hallelujah. Thank That's you, right. Father. Brother Callan, would you be so kind as to go ahead and close the show with a prayer for everyone tonight? Sure. Father, I thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank you for what he has done and what he means to I am so thankful that I belong to him. And I'm sure everyone that has been born again is so thankful that they belong to him. Lord, I just pray in the name of Jesus that your people will not be ignorant. I pray, Lord, that they will not be afraid, that they will know that you are the mighty God and that you are in them to know who they are in Christ, to know that you are always for them, to know that you are not looking for faults in their life or to criticize them or to find fault, but you are looking to accept them, for we are without reproach in your sight. And, Father, I ask in the name of Jesus that you would begin to open doors to the people who have this understanding, that they can minister to these people that have been abducted that are not saved, that they can minister to them and get them delivered and get them saved so that, like, that's in my book. I put 10 testimonies in there of people who got born again and were able to stop alien abductions from themselves and their families. Lord, these people need to hear the gospel. They need to hear the truth. Reveal it to them. Reveal your love to them. And let us be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. For we ask this in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. And Brother Colin, really quick, when you tell people, where can they go to get your inf more information? Uh, tell them a little bit more about your books. Where can they go to find all that stuff? Okay, they're on Amazon.com. They're not in print yet, but they are uh, an ebook that they can download on Amazon.com. In fact, um, um, there's, I think I've got four or five books on there. Uh, one, Do You Believe You Deserve to Be Happy? And what that one is about is is showing you that the things in the past in your life cause sickness in the body, and if you can get your heart healed and forgive, your body will be automatically be healed. You can receive healing. Uh, the other one is called um, These Signs Will Follow Them That Believe in My Name. I believe in that scripture that there is no punctuation in the scriptures, so I believe the comma is in the wrong place in uh, Mark 16, 17, where it says, These signs will follow them that believe in my name. Well, those signs don't follow just every believer. But it follows the signs of those who believe in his name. So I titled the book, These Signs Shall Follow Them That Believe in My Name, The Story of One Man Who Believed. And that's my story of my walk with the Lord, the special anointing I got, uh, healing the sick, casting out devils, and even had experience raising the dead. And then the other book that I came out with is called um, Do Pets Go to Heaven? That's in print and in uh, other ones, uh, e-book. And uh, that's good to give the people who have lost a pet, and maybe they're not saved, and it tells that they can... Uh, uh, be reunited with their pet in heaven because God doesn't lose anything. If these pets died and that was the end of them, we'd have to admit that Satan defeated God in his creation of animals, but he didn't. So that gives a lot of scripture in there to prove that the, they do go to heaven. And then the, the other book came out was called Aliens, UFOs are being forced by God to land on the earth. The Bible declares it. That's the same book. I changed the title. As they are coming before the rapture, and it shows a picture of a fallen angel. Those are the same book. So if you get one, you don't need to get the other. They're both the same book. But I take it through all the scripture there. I take a lot of testimonies uh, of people who have been abducted. Uh, I, I follow my own guidelines of two or three scriptures that prove everything. And at the back of the book, there's uh, ten testimonies of people who've overcome, gotten born again, and stopped alien abductions and actually drove them out of their house and out of their room. And so uh, I think you'll find it a very... Interesting read. In fact, I've got a warning at the beginning of the book. It says, this book is intended for mature Christian only. This book can be hazardous to your theology. So there's a lot of revelation in there. 
Praise God. That's awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining us tonight. God bless you, brother. This was just an absolutely awesome, edifying, and uplifting show, and a, just a great opportunity for people to be able to spread the word and warn people about the strong delusion that's coming upon this earth, the alien invasion that's coming upon this earth. Folks, be ye doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, deceiving yourselves. Get out there. Send emails around. Let people know about this. Get the word out, folks, because these are things that we can do to help bring in that harvest when stuff gets when stuff starts falling apart all across the earth and, and it's gonna folks and this is a great opportunity for you to serve the king of kings our friend our advocate jesus praise god thank you brother callan for joining us tonight this was absolutely a very fun show to do god bless you god, my pleasure thank you for having me you bet praise god